Welcome to DAX Machina, with your hosts, Naoma Finn, Steve Wildman Monrotis, and D.A. Roberts. Join us as we explore writing, books, authors, and all things horror. We will delve into the sightings, reports, encounters, and tales of monsters. We will also explore the writings of D.A. Roberts along with others in the horror genre. We will investigate the possibilities that monsters may not be safely locked away in the pages of books. They might just walk among us even now. Grab some popcorn and lock the doors. It's going to be a creepy journey. Welcome to DAX Machina. <laughs> Good evening, folks, and welcome to another edition of DAX Machina. You're with us on a Saturday night. Joining me tonight is my partner in crime, Steve Wildman Monrotis. Uh, we have some guests in the audience tonight. As always, we got Dave, Kerry Pocket Doc Davis from, from Dark Angel Medical is going to be with us to offer his unique perspective into some of the weirder things that have happened in the world. And tonight we have Fred and Anna joining us in the studio, and I'll let them tell them tell about themselves here briefly. And uh, before we jump in with both feet, and I think uh, some of these stories you're going to hear tonight, folks, are really going to be pretty interesting. Uh, Anna, ladies first, we'll start with you. You can introduce yourself, and then we'll have Fred tell us some stories. Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, I've been doing, I guess, live shows for over 10 years, and um, we were talking and <laughs> come to find out we kind of know the same people, so <laughs> that kind of validates a little bit of me, I guess. But I've been into cryptids, um, paranormal psychic stuff and everything all my life i guess since i was four so i can touch up on pretty much anything i guess there's not much i can't put a comment or two in on anyway well i'm uh, interested to talk to you about your uh, your history with mufon and kgra that'll be a, a, an interesting discussion but uh we'll, uh we'll get to that here shortly fred you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and then uh, i think we'll jump in with your story yeah, I'm Fred. I'm from uh, Bristol Bay, Alaska, member of various tribal councils and whatnot. Um, I'm, I'd like to pass along a different perspective on the whole hairy man foot thing as far as my perspective, what happened with us and uh, what I feel are the, the dangers. Uh, back in uh, 2006, an elder relative, he... Uh, he had uh, planned out a, a gold panning trip. He wanted to do some prospecting. So we got a hold of Chug Young Unlimited, got the, the rights to go up there and uh, pick out a spot. And anyway, it was my elder relative, his son and me, and uh, us younger guys were the help. <laughs> uh, we were approximately 247 river miles up the Nushigak River on a tributary of the Nushigak called the Nuyakuk River. Um, remote is an understatement. It, it's vast. It's as pristine and wild as it gets. Uh, the overall plan was to uh, bullpen for 10 days, see what he could come up with and possibly stake a claim, you know, he'll get rich or whatever. Uh, sorry, my blood pressure goes up a little bit once I start reliving this in my mind. Uh, I would imagine. Yeah, it, it's uh, anyway. Uh, uh, sorry, my mind just kind of starts playing real fast in my head as far as flashbacks of what was going on. So uh, we're up the New York River, and it we're about twenty miles off of where from where it branches off the Nushigak, going towards Tick Chick Lake and the New York Falls, and uh, we. Uh, my elder relative had already pre-planned where we were going to go. Um, it was the remnants of a, a counting tower, a little uh, shack where the uh, fish and game biologists and observers will count salmon on the returning streams. And uh, it's basically an eight foot shack. It's a glorified cardboard box and it had this little 50 style uh, trailer jettisoned off the back of it. 
one of those old toe behind, but it was converted into a little bunk area with two bunks on one side, two on the other. And it just stuck off the middle in the back. It was kind of a weird shape, but it, it's what they had there. And it was slapped together. It was two by fours and five eighths plywood. A uh, couple of small windows, 18 by 24. And a little drip oil stove, a little nothing. I mean, it was, there was nothing to the place, but it was dried in. And that's where he chose. So we got there and uh, it, it takes a while to unload everything. We were in, a, I mean, it took a couple of days to get there by skiff. We came in a 22 foot flat bottom, 40 horse outboard. It, it took a while. So we unload all the gold panning gear and, uh, I wanted a black bear that year. I wanted to get a rug because that's brown bear, but I wanted to get a good black bear rug. We are discussing that. It was a little too late in the day. After unloading everything, we, we decided we're just going to stick at camp and do our thing to the next day. Uh, I just bought a brand new uh, 870, uh, 870 Remington pump, but it had the uh, rifle barrel and some ghost ring sights on it. Matt stainless is beautiful rifle. I, buying it remote, it was a little over eight hundred bucks. It, it was crazy, but I wanted it, so I got it. Into fishing season, you know, I had the money for it. Anyway, had that, and I wanted to use that as a slug gun to drop that bear or whatever else. And uh, I was discussing that. We're sitting there, and they, there's a little card table um, next to one of the windows. Uh, when you walk up to this place at the riverbank, it's a seven foot riverbank. It's on the cut, and uh, uh, at the top of the bank, it's about 20 feet maybe to the doorway of this little. Shop. And uh, the doorway, when you're facing it, is uh, to your left hand side. And directly inside the door would be the card table over to the right, a real small little dinky counter, I guess you would call it, with the other window. And uh, the little oil stove was off into the corner as you step into the, the little basically small room. And uh, so my two relatives, they sat down at that little card table and they were playing cribbage. Now, some time is passing here. We're, we're discussing the next day where he wants to dig some... Uh, sample buckets of you know pay dirt and see if it's worth anything or whatever and we're discussing that and uh i don't know where the whole place creaks now it's it's getting long in the dark now not fully pitch black out but dark outside and uh the whole place creaks just out of the blue and the wind wasn't blowing uh, this place was like instead a glorified box it, it would have been evident to us if the wind was blowing. So we kind of look at each other like, what the heck was that? And uh, my relative closest to the window, my younger relative, over his shoulder as I'm looking at him, I saw something dark move out of view of the window. And uh, um, sorry, I get the chills just thinking about it. I, I got a real vivid memory and it's creepy, but so he saw my reaction and he jumps up and starts kind of laughing like, uh, you know, Hey, hey, that's not funny. And I said, no, I saw something move. Uh, and immediately we thought bear, you know, cause typically that's, you know, what we would deal with, especially right on the river, right at the end of the salmon run. It, it's more common than, you know, a, it, it just happens all the time. Well, something in the air changed. Uh, there was like an oppressive, primal uh, not understanding. It's hard to explain it. Uh, like you were being hunted? Yes, like a rat in a hole and wolves are outside kind of feeling, but there was nothing tangible at this point. But we were on alert, so when he saw my reaction, he immediately jumped up, grabbed the 30 out six. Um, I was already loading the shotgun, and we had a million uh, candlelight power spotlight. We were gonna. Uh, our game plan was okay. We'll run this bear off because we're we're still at this point. Even though it was, we've dealt with bears forever. He's helped me on bear control missions for 
the village of Alekmege, but so we're well versed in bears. So we grab the spotlight and I tell him, okay, I'm going to push the door open. I'll have my shotgun and I'll beam since my shotgun's, you know, a little easier to wield around than the 30 out of six he had. And you come out beside me and we'll see what we got, what we're dealing with. And push this little door open that's two by four framed and skinned on one side. This whole whole place was only skinned on the outside. Uh, a glorified box. So as the doors open, we beam immediately in front of the little shack to the uh, river's edge where the uh, bank drops off. And we don't see anything. And as I pan back to our left, uh, I hit the tree line approximately 50 yards away and we saw three sets of eye shine uh, uh, get the creeps thinking about it uh, it looked like uh, fence post markers three sets of them uh, big red reflection uh, uh, eerie and, and like creepy are, are like the biggest understatement because immediately we, we recognize something's not right uh, jump back in, shut the door. And now this little door only had one of those little J hooks and an eyelet uh, to keep it closed. This this place was of no secure means at all. Uh, just, oh, uh, why, how I'm here, I, I don't know. But, so as we're standing there, we're looking at each other like, what the fuck? What, excuse my language, what the hell? You know, what, what are we dealing with here? And, uh, this this place is small, like eight foot by eight foot square. As we're having a little bit of small talk, uh, he like dart shoots underneath the little card table um, in a heartbeat. It, it looked like he was flung down there. I, I never seen someone move so fast, but he's clutching the barrel. He's got a death grip on the barrel of that thirty out six. And he's holding it kind of like you would in, uh, if you're holding a hand over an oar. And so he's under the table. Sorry, my heart rate goes up. Um, and the way he's death gripping on the barrel, he's looking across the room towards the other window. And uh, the, my older relative was over in the little cubby way into the sleeping area of that old 50 style trailer, which, I mean, every... Everyone's within, I can touch them. They're, they're within distance. Like, it, everything happened right. Like, you know, not in far, far distance at all. So I look over and I sent you that picture I drew. And that's what I saw when I looked out the, the window opposite of where we happened to be, which is only three feet away from me at this point. The feeling... Uh, that the whole place filled with was uh imminent death not not fear of like oh ah uh, something bad no it was like death like uh okay i see you got the, you're showing the picture there well it narrowed its gaze and hardened its look and squinted his eyes more as it started moving towards its left my right and at this point, I was on autopilot. I had that shotgun offhand. And, uh, I can shoot ambidextrous, but I, I'm more of a right-handed shooter. I right, left-handed, but anyway, it's a thing. Um, it was autopilot. Just as it cleared the window and was moving, everything, there was so much pressure in that room at this point. When I, I shot three times through the wall, boom, boom, boom. Um, there was no ear ringing from the shots. It, it was just like we had earmuffs on since we came in the door and last little J hook. It, it, the pressure was immense. Um, there was a horrific scream. Uh, felt it in it, the whole place rattled from the scream and the whole place shifted a couple feet uh, towards the river. And my initial, my initial thought was, oh, fuck, they're going to push us in the river, you know? Uh, I, I can't even, uh, I don't have the words to express the level of primal fear. Every fiber of your being, uh, it's that fight or flight. 
but knowing uh, it was like uh i knew after i had shot and there was a scream and the place shifted i immediately had a feeling of all right this this is how it's gonna end uh, uh, not to make light of it but it's like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna have to go out fighting these things uh because there was there was evidently more than one you know so the whole place shift the lantern that uh we were using was a coleman a little white gas one i have to pump up every once in a while uh, my older relative is back in the bunk area sitting on the bunk basically shut down not not responding to anything because i'm i'm trying to talk to somebody about what in the hell's going on here uh because i felt all alone in that moment i just got done shooting through uh, like these are hardened lifelong hunters uh skilled fishermen commercial salmon fish these are these are alaskan men they're not uh just wallflowers that go out on the weekends weekend warrior type food lifelong subsistence uh hardened people is what i'm getting at and i'm trying to hold it together because at this point i i, I feel like my younger relative under the table i want to curl up in a corner uh the the oppressive uh like hatred I, I, it was palpable hate that was like almost like being oppressed on us it's hard to explain uh it, it was uh the level of fear because even right now i can feel my uh blood pressure in my eyes i can feel the anyway so i'm sitting there and i'm trying to communicate with my younger relative under the table periodically because it went dead quiet after i shot the scream the place shifted i was anticipating the worst i thought we we're going in the river and we're gonna have to swim for it or, or something i don't know it was it was all but understand it's taken me way longer to tell you what happened and how it happened it, it this all transpired rather quickly from when we shut that door to him being under the table and me shooting through the wall it it, it was all just real quick um it seemed like a week at the time but so there's two chairs that were in there i uh i slid one over to the door whatever good that would do uh and for the life of me in those moments i, I couldn't figure out why didn't they just smash this little cardboard box and <sighs> smack it against a tree or something you know because they were powerful enough to do it so I take the other chair and I'm sitting with my back towards the little cubby area because there's no windows back there and I could kind of, I could see both windows and kind of sit guard for whatever good that would do. And it, it felt uh, every movement I made, like whenever I'd have to pump the lamp, uh, was uh, if in my memory it flashes like microseconds. Uh, kind of like a frame by frame uh, just because I was on the verge of losing it. I was really, I had horrible thoughts running through my head about these people I love uh, because I felt they weren't helping, you know, we're all going to die and you're not going to help me. It's hard to explain. Uh, I don't know exactly how much time had went by. Now this time of year up here in Alaska, uh, we have a 12 hour, 12 hour light cycle, 12 hours daylight, 12 hours a night, that time of year. And, uh, so basically we, I, like I said, I don't know how much time it transpired, but finally my younger relative started, uh, communicating with me again. I asked him, you know, what the hell did you see? And then I told him what I saw. And I was, I kept that my finger in his face for a reaction to make sure he was still, still just babbling because he had went on. Like initially after I shot, shot through the wall and the whole place shifted, I, I, I tried to get the 30 odd sick from him because I wanted a more powerful gun. He, he had such a death grip on it. I didn't want to risk it going off and shooting him because he, he was really panic stricken. He locked up. 
uh, babbling, mumbling. But uh, he assured me he was okay and doing better. And he told me that uh, this thing showed him his teeth in the window. And it was uh, a little further back. And after it showed its teeth, it came in closer to get a better look in the window. And that's when we turned and saw it. So, uh, like I said, I don't know how much time it passed, but he finally st- he got up, started moving, um, was acting more like himself. Uh, my older relative still was not communicating anything. Um, I think at this point he had laid down in his sleeping bag. Uh, he was in his mid late sixties. Anyway, I can't speak for him, but, uh, we decided we're going to flash, uh, we're going to use the spotlight and we're going to look out the windows and, and see what we can see. Cause I'm trying to quarterback a plan of escape. It, it's pitch black out. It's going to be almost impossible to navigate the river. Um, I had thoughts of let's float, just let the current take us. But there's so many uh, deadfall trees, uh, rocks in the river. Um, it, it, it was really unknown to us. It's way up the Nushigak. We, we always are around, you know, from the studio hop down to Dillingham on the uh, Nushigak River. But this is 247 miles away from Dillingham by river. So it, it's really remote and we don't know it all that well. But uh, so we spotlight the one side by the river and then we go to the bank side where the tree line is where we saw the ice shine. And I start from that end to see if there's still ice shine going on. There was nothing, and we start scanning back. And uh, there was an outhouse about 40, 50 foot off the back side of this uh, little shack. Uh, kind of like at a kitty corner angle from the shack, so to speak. It's kind of like not directly off the back, but offset. And as I got over to that point, uh, this huge pitch black um that outhouse was at least eight eight and a half foot tall because they made it with uh, minimal cuts to the wood uh this thing was back behind it but a, a little ways behind it but we could still see its upper part of its body from like the sternum up and it had to be every bit of five and a half feet wide, um, 13, 14 feet tall, massive cartoon. I, I, can't, I can't express how big this thing was. Uh, it made the one staring in the window look like a child. It was massive. And ev- every ounce of blood ran out of my body like the, the we immediately shut off that spotlight and we were back in that little uh tuck back cubby and we were literally had barrels crossed and and we were not in our right minds but we we took defensive positions like the the insanity of the moment uh my relative there was a bent nail that had been on the floor 16 penny nail god only knows how long it had been there and just kind of on the floor as we were moving around before all this happened. And he was like, I'm going to, I'm going to grab that nail. I'm going to nail that door shut. And I was like, think about what you just said. There's you comp stay with me. Don't go off into that world of, you know, he was on the borderline of losing. Like, think about what you're saying. That nail isn't stopping anything. So, I'm sitting there. I'm shaking right now just thinking about this. Um, when we tucked back in, it, it went dead quiet again. There was, like, no sound. Deafening sound. No movements by the windows. Uh, it, to say we were scared was just, like, would be such a understatement. Um, it started... A good 10, 11 hours had to have passed during this whole time. And it's we can tell there's a difference in the sky, so it's going to start getting a light soon. And uh, 
obviously now we know that there was the one that looked in the window that I shot through the wall at. There was three that we saw at the tree line earlier and this big one. Uh, the scariest thing about that big one for me wasn't its size. We had a uh, million kilowatt spotlight and they're not the best for long term, but when they're charged, they're nice and bright. They put a good beam. Um, the one we had used those big square six volt batteries and mm -hmm. we had fresh batteries. So it still had a really good beam to it. And uh, this thing absorbed light. Um, I get the chills thinking about it because it, it seemed like nothingness was big, big nothingness was right there and it was there for us. Uh, like, I, I don't know, I don't have the words to express the, every fiber of your being it, it wants to run, but it's stuck in your skin. Uh, it felt like a constant electrocution through your body because your muscles want to to run like uh, I, I don't know it's hard to explain so with it being dead quiet we're calming down we're we're getting we're getting confidence for our escape because like at this point I didn't think we were gonna make it like uh, I knew I was gonna fight but I didn't think this was anything I was going to see the other side of. Uh, the the oppression in the air, the... Uh, forgive me, it's hard to put into words. Well, you're uh, fine, I, take your time. Yeah, primal is the best thing. Primal, where a fear you didn't know you have, but once you have that fear, you understand it, I guess. Uh, it's it's real hard to explain. Um, off in the distance, not not too far away, it almost sounded like a, a helicopter was coming. Rotor watch, you know, thump 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 thump. Uh, and this only lasted a brief moment, but we started feeling it in the ground. Thump thump thump. It was one of these things running past it, bolted past that window. And uh, all of a sudden, after it ran past, it was like there was some of them staged around us and they all started running around. Uh, oh, I get chills thinking about it because you would see a flash past the window every once in a while. And it's just getting light enough to where uh, Uh, Alaska is a different kind of dark, <laughs> like, uh, I'm sure people can relate to what I'm, they've probably been to a place like that to where when it's dark, it's really dark. And then when it, when it starts to get a little light, when you're used to it, you can start kind of making things out. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you're better trained at, uh, better night vision. Uh, cause at this point that lamp died out. Uh, we, that thing went out once we saw the big nothingness. Uh, massive. So all this is going on, and I'm getting this feeling at the same time, like they're toying with us. Uh, I'm, we're being toyed with. Uh, it was like they're trying to flush us out. I I kept feeling like they're trying to get us out of where we are. Uh, now, grant you, some might say, you know, that's pretty irresponsible. You, you didn't identify what you were shooting at through the wall. Uh, before you know pulling the trigger but you, something in you in those moments you know you need to be defending yourself if that makes sense i don't want to make it sound like i'm just you know some uh, trigger happy yahoo out in the woods that's just going to start shooting that stuff randomly that's not that's not what i do uh well i don't think so all this is going on and they know that i'm just you I, I didn't, I shot through the wall adjacent to the window uh, it, it just because it had started moving quickly and that was my response was boom, boom, boom. So uh, it, it seemed like they would go a little distance away, wait a moment or two and then start running around the building again. And you could feel they were different sized ones by the impact of their feet. Like uh, 
you could tell when a really big one was off in the distance coming to run by because you could feel it different on the ground. Uh, I get uh, every hair on my body feels like it's trying to run away. <laughs> but uh, that calms down. Uh, duration of time, it felt like 10, 15 minutes, but we weren't in our right mind. So it could have been a little longer uh, than that. But it, it's definitely getting lighter, and we're we're on the better side of it starting to turn lighter. And uh, so again, we because we were white knuckle terror, not breathing when these things were running around. Um, a couple different times, it almost smelled. Uh, it almost sounded like they were trying to smell through the trailer. Oh, get the freaking EBGBs just thinking about it, but. I, that's speculation. I don't know. In the moments you're sitting there in the dead quiet, and then all of a sudden stuff's going on. It's weird, the little things that stand out. Uh, but all sorts of weird noises were going off in the distance, too. Uh, types of yelling. Uh, um, we were so gripped by terror at this point, I, I couldn't honestly tell you oh, it sounded like this or it sounded like that. It, it was just noise at this point off in the distance. Um, all the running had stopped and it had been dead quiet for a while. And again, we start building our confidence. All we have to do is get down to the riverbank. The boat's ready to go. It just, all it needs is us. We can go. Um, a good half hour, 45 minutes, I would say, past. Um, and then we started hearing it sounded like someone was shooting a pellet gun at the uh, plywood side of the, the jack it's like what the hell is that what is this now you know because it really sounded like you know you go shoot a pellet gun at a at a piece of plywood and it was making that sound and then it started like like a hailstorm hitting the side of it and then it, it died down and I glanced out the window and there's a bunch of small rocks. They had started throwing small rocks at it. So that let us know that there, it was, I don't know if they're trying to get a head count on us or, or, or see if that would make us run out. Cause the whole feeling we got was they were trying to get us out of where we were to get their hands on us. And, and again, why, why they didn't just break the place apart. I, I I don't know. I would have, if, you know, if I was on the other side of that being that powerful, uh, that going to snatch us out of that would have been easy. But anyway, so now we we don't know what we're really going to do because it seems like every time we're getting up to gumption to make a break, a new round of something terrifying is happening, even though it was mundane with it being rocks, but in context of what the whole thing, it was just one more, what the hell is really going on here? Um, <clears throat> so we get our, we get our game plan and it dawns on me when, when we bank, when we bank that skiff, uh, our anchor line was a good 50 to 70 ish feet long. Um, uh, and we had drug it up over the bank and stuck it in the tundra. So we're we're tied off, and I sure as hell ain't going to go and retrieve that anchor. So uh, there's about 10 foot of chain and then just regular uh, rope. So I had my younger relative, the, uh, the pocket knife I had, and game plan was he was going to take my 870. He had my pocket knife. Uh, he, he was really good. It was his boat and outboard um he was going to go down and get started i'm right behind him i'm backing him up with the 30 about six and my older relative is going to come behind me now there was another shotgun it was my older relatives old uh, some kind of monstrous uh pump action goose gun basically but we had that loaded as well i had it slung over my shoulder though because my older relative, mid to late sixties, he wasn't feeble, but not, you know, gonna run and, and do jumping jacks or anything like that. Uh, 
we make our decision, okay, we're going to go. I went out, looked at the one side of the windows on the tree line side, saw nothing, no movement. The other window to make sure we weren't going to just step right out to an ambush. Uh, and at this point, I'm still feeling like, ah, eh, we're not going to make it. Um, in those moments, you come to grips with certain things. So uh, I already had it in my mind that, that you know, I'm going to save a bullet for one of these, not for myself, but for when one of these get close enough that I, I, I could do something with it. That was going on in the back of my mind. Uh, 2020 hindsight thing. Sorry about that. Uh, no problem. So we stack up on the door and I say, let's go. Uh, reminded him, cut the rope. I said, please don't shut down as soon as we get outside the door. If you see one of them, just keep moving. If it starts coming, then you start shooting. But if you just see it, just keep moving. And uh, he assured me he was good to go. And I said, okay, let's go. And so he kind of, he hesitated a little bit. And I understand. Uh, I totally understand. I, I didn't want no part of this either. You know, I didn't. Anyway, so door, we swing the door open. I'm right behind him. Um, I glance over to my left and I keep looking and checking behind us to make sure we're not getting something running up on our six. Uh, he gets to the bank's edge and, and, cuts down like it's a seven foot drop but it's about 12 feet of trail uh i have my older relative come around me and start going down the bank he's a little older it was gonna take him time i had i knelt down on my knee and kind of the upper part had a lot of uh, erosion so and, and the grass was down and it was slick right there so i knelt down a little further to help him until he got his footing could dig his heels in, so to speak. And as I was standing back up, um, I, I scooted back a little bit from the edge before I stood up. And I think doing that was the only thing that saved me because as I came to stand up full height, uh, sorry, this messed me up a little bit because it really, it upset me a lot. Fred, you're okay. So, Take your time. So this rock, uh, bigger than a basketball, uh, comes whizzing by my head like instantly everything goes slow motion in my mind and my eyes automatically lock onto that rock and I watch it fly out and it impacted the river uh, in a spot that was roughly about three foot deep and it impacted it so hard. Now this is a moving river. It's, it's not some little still water, you know, eddy. It, it's a river. It's moving water. Um, it impacted so hard that it hit the bottom of the river before the river could uh, close up over it. Very loud on the impact. Uh, so automatically my eyes, uh, my head whips in the direction this rock came from. And that big black thing comes out of the trees. Uh, and this whole time I felt like there was no reason they couldn't have had us it. Uh, I felt toyed with from shortly after the beginning of it. I felt like it, it's hard to explain. It, it felt like we were being played with. You know? uh, like they were feeding on our fear almost, it seemed. Anyway, that, that's speculation. Uh, <clears throat> so immediately, I, I got the 30 odd six and I shoot it three times center mass. I, I'm, I'm not trying to brag. I'm a good shot. Boom, boom, boom. It, it, didn't flinch. It, it stopped moving forward because it was like moving like a. It was so black you couldn't see any like limb movement. It was just a black mass moving, uh, like those old monster movies where Dracula would come out of the fog, just kind of like he's not walking, just kind of gliding, kind of similar to that without the fog, but a big ass, freaking scary thing, uh, massive cartoon. I couldn't make out definition but it was hulking it was uh like the the scariest thing you could imagine but i i hadn't even seen any features other than its size but it was it was the blackness the the 
it absorbed. I mean, it, it looked like it absorbed light when I beamed it with that spotlight. Mm -hmm. Like, what what can do that? Like, uh, anyway, that that was scarier than its size. It really was it, the fact of how black it was. And uh, so I shoot, and like every alarm bell in me is like screaming, "Run!" Um, like I said, it stopped moving forward that I, as far as I could tell, but it didn't, it didn't flinch from my shots. It, and I had, uh, 180 grain core lock soft tip, uh, deadliest mushroom in the woods. I, I've killed everything with that round. And, and this thing just like nothing. Uh, so I jumped down to the bank. Uh, my younger relative did not cut the rope. Um, and he had thrown my shotgun onto the little beach there. I don't know if he did it so his dad had access to a gun. I, I don't know. I, I never got an answer from that, uh, why he did that. But I asked for my knife. He threw it to me. And he was revving the outboard really high. And I was trying to yell at him, idle it down so you could shift it. Because uh, that outboard, if it was idled high, it, it wouldn't shift or reverse. And uh, I, cut, I cut the line. And just as I do, I'm putting the chain into the bow. My older relative is sitting on the edge of the skip and trying to swing his legs. I shoved him in. Uh, like, I feel bad that I did, but I, I shoved his ass in there. It's like, no, no, get, you know, this isn't a pleasure cruise. We're out of here. Um, my thought was to grab my shotgun. But as I, I shoved him and I'm getting the chain in the rest of the way, uh, he got it shifted into reverse. And where my older relative had landed, he had, he was able to turn himself around to face towards the bow of the skip. And uh, my younger relative's face went uh, real startled. All the blood left his face, and my older relative kind of leaned back in the skiff, eyes big as saucers, and I looked up behind me because they were looking up at the bank above me, behind me. And uh, I, I looked up. And it's the big one. It, it's it's up there, but all I could make it to was its shin um, when I was looking up. Now, this all happened in a microsecond, but uh, the only thing that really stood out to me about it being on the bank, outside of the uh, obvious intimidation factor, like you couldn't have felt smaller uh, in that moment, but I noticed the tips of the hairs uh, were like a cinnamon uh, auburn type of tinge of red to them. And that really, uh, I, I pushed off and jumped in and we uh, were able to kind of idle and spud on them there. Um, the, the thing didn't move from the bank. Uh, and like what what really blows me away is they had us by all dead rights they had us cold. There was no reason they couldn't have snatched us up like at, at any point during this whole thing. And so, you know, I I appreciate everyone's experiences. Don't get me wrong. Uh, speaking from mine, when I when I hear gifting or um, attempts of uh, maybe. A, a closer encounter with these things, I cringe because of what I just explained. Uh, and it's not to catch dispersions on anybody. I, that's not what I mean. I, I'm just simply from what I've seen, and it may be due to our remoteness up here, lack of population, you know, that they want to interact differently. Um, but yeah, that's that's the gist of the most intense uh, night I've ever had. Wow. Did you ever go back to the shotgun? Hell no, screw that gun. <laughs> <laughs> all, all of the shotgun and all of your gold panning equipment, you guys just... All the gold. There was a couple thousand dollars worth of nice little sluice boxes. My other relative thought ahead. He had planned this out two years in advance. He got the most manageable, portable type of gold panning stuff you could get. 
we left totes of stuff, brand new Coleman stove, lantern, my shotgun, uh, hunting clothes. Uh, I, I honestly, I, they can go gold panning, I guess. I, I got no, <laughs> no cares about what happened to that stuff. Wow. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would have gone back for it either. Dude, that yeah. like, that is absolutely terrifying. Wow. That's a bit. You know, uh, yeah. Doc, it reminds me of that uh, that scene in Curse of the Windigo that uh, your namesake has with the snowmobile. <laughs> Dude, Absolutely. I, uh, that you know, was one of the most terrifying yeah. encounters I've ever heard. What uh, what sticks in my head about this whole thing, Fred, is when you're describing the, uh, uh, I think you were using the rotor wash term. Uh, you know, we hear the, the, the footsteps as, as they're running around outside mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, it reminds me of, um, like the, uh, ape behavior when you see like in these nature films with like a chimpanzee or something, a chimpanzee herd, when they've got a, uh, some kind of a prey item they, they go into like this frenzy where they'd all just kind of run around and, and, you know, Slam the orbit ground. around it. And what, yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. ape behavior you're talking about. I mean, it's God, it's scary as hell. Well, the whole time I felt like they were trying to flush us out. Um, after I shot through the wall and the whole place shifted, it really, um, that, it, I wish I could just share a portion of that, that, uh, primal fear with those who are, uh, making those, uh, advances towards some kind of better, uh, relationship with these things. Just not, not to scare them away from it, but to give them a better understanding of what these things will, will do. Um, I feel it anyway. I, I, this is all just anecdotal from some guy in Alaska. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything good that could come of any kind of close interaction. I, I not for me anyway. I, I only get I got is heavy caliber, uh, high velocity. That's that's about all that, I got for him. That's not not an uncommon type of story out of Alaska. I hear they're mm. very aggressive up there. Yeah, and like I said, I think it's it has to do with how remote it is because uh, it's it's vast wilderness. I mean, uh, Alaska's a big friggin' state, you know. Uh, well, we got four major mountain ranges up here. Uh, gosh, tons of mountains over, you know, several miles tall. Uh, yeah, it, it's just a vast wilderness. It's a vast frontier, I mean. Mm -hmm. I read an article one time. They said that if you give one square mile of land to every person in Alaska, you run out of people before you run out of land. Yeah. You know, that's, that's wow. ridiculous. And, and you know, that, that, that panicked behavior that they had, I mean, as, as remote as everything is, I mean, you, you were literally 247 river miles from nowhere. Uh, yeah. They probably had encountered firearms before. You know, I'm not sure. Uh, them. I think me shooting through the wall stopped there, whatever the initial plan was. Uh, I think uh, after I fired those shots, it changed their approach to how they were going to deal with us. If you hadn't have done that, they might have just cracked that building like an egg. Uh, yeah, I think I think it gave them second thought now this is all speculation but i think it gave them second thoughts on on whatever their plan was initially because when that thing was looking in the window um yeah that's a pencil sketch i, I drew that in like 10 minutes but um uh, one thing that that is not on there is the fact that uh the lighter part in the eyes that was the lamplight reflecting in auburn kind of red in its in its eyes so it was like a a transparent black marble with a, a red luminescence from the perspective i had just before i started shooting um yeah uh, i get to chose this thinking about uh the way it uh hardened its look it squinted its brow down a little more just as it started moving out of my our view and, and that yeah it there was no doubt in my mind what the intent of this was, and it was us on the dinner menu is how it felt to me. Hmm. I, I definitely feel like you were being hunted. 
yeah, dude, it, dude, I'm telling you, that is one of the one of the most terrifying stories I've ever heard. And, and what really kills me is these these two relatives that I, I love them like I, my whole life. Uh, they they won't even talk to me about what happened. They won't engage. They last I tried to talk to them about this all happened in 2006. Um, last time I tried to talk to them about it, like hey, remember you know, uh, they wouldn't even acknowledge the the trip. And it's like, you got to be freaking kidding me, dude. <laughs> uh, you know, we weren't drunk. We weren't high. It was none of that. It, uh, we were we were worker bees for an older relative. It was an elder. Boy. I'm a village boy. What are you going to do? You're going to go and help your elder. Uh, yeah, it was it was intense. Um, like, it's been 15 years, and my heart rate still goes up. I still, I still see everything vividly. Um, did uh, yeah. did they have a, like a, a flatter face or did they have a pronounced snout? No, it was a it was a it was hard to tell in that pencil drawing, um, but it it reminded me of uh, the eyes were sunk in a little bit, but like the shape of around the eyes reminded me of uh, like uh, Native American, like you see those old photos, but take the nose and and flatten it more to the face. And then the hair and the brows and whatnot. It uh, it had a human like face, but not none of them. Uh, uh, like seeing them in bits and flashes, it's really hard to like pinpoint uh, finer details. It was more uh, shapes once we got outside because when that big one was coming out of the tree line. There was mo other movement in the tree line, but my focus was, I assumed that this big one, because that I, I felt that's the one that took the rock. At least it was the first one coming out. So, I, I mean, I wish I had, uh, 2020 hindsight, I wish I had a bigger gun and more ammo in that moment and uh, maybe went for headshots versus center mass, you know. I, yeah. So would you say it looked more more something like something like this or like this? Um, I'm not seeing the examples you're trying to show. Where oh, are you wow. showing? I've got pictures brought up on screen. I guess they're not coming through on your end. I can no. see yeah, wow. Here. <clears throat> Very clear. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not I, seeing the, the reference. I personally would have sh would have shut down at the point where, and I put three thirty got six rounds into it, and it didn't flinch. That's yeah, still that's... hard for me to grasp. I've I've I was raised one shot, one kill. I've never not. Uh, I've never had to. Uh, chamber a second round using a 30 odd six when i've been hunting not ever uh that's not braggadocia that's how we were raised you don't you don't want to shoot a big ass moose have it get adrenalized and run off and die uh you get tough meat you know you cook it eight hours and chew it for 12 you you want it to drop for you where it's at and that's how we were raised and putting those rounds on it i knew i wasn't missing i that particular rifle was a family work course. Like everyone used that rifle for their first moves, caribou, whatever. It was flat shooting, dead ass accurate, reliable gun. Like, yeah, generally something that big is big enough to take down just about anything. I've hunted with 30 out six and brought down everything I've ever shot. Yeah. Yeah, with no with no problem. I and in those soft tip 180 grain core lock uh, rounds, those things are, you know, they're wicked. They they really are the deadliest mushroom in the woods. As far as you know, I've used green tips. I've you know I've I bought into the hype of various rounds, but uh, I shot a just shy of 1600 pound bull moose. Uh, just shy of a 60 inch rack, um, big bodied, massive, uh, 
bull one shot in the neck with one of those and it dropped dead spewing blood like a faucet out of the entry wound that 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 moose was massive like so when i'm you know that 2020 hindsight thing it, it like there's parts of what happened i wish i had done things differently but i can't i can't change that like mainly uh those relatives not not talking to me you know I, I wish that that part of it didn't go down that way but i mean it is what it is wow well the first thing i would have done is made sure i carried a bigger damn gun if there, you know yeah have a uh, 30 millimeters something on a yeah on a four -wheeler. that mistake damn. was never made again as far as you know now there's four five eights with giggle switches and uh various other things that are around so but yeah it uh, i i feel because of what happened that, that the only good one's a deceased one and i'm biased I, I so viewers or listeners don't you don't have to take what i'm saying is uh, i'm not trying to project it onto what you may be dealing with you but up here it's a different it's a totally different environment yeah if you live through a uh, a violent encounter i can understand why you would feel that way that's that man that is that is some serious serious creepy i mean i i don't yeah. know how i would have reacted I, I i did 20 years in law enforcement i, I kind of always pictured myself as being pretty calm under fire but i don't even know how i would have reacted in, in a situation like that yeah, I, I'm really surprised I held it together. It was it was real hard. Yeah, I can't imagine the the mass of this thing. I mean, Cartoon literally, big. probably. Cartoon yeah, I mean, big. You're, you're talking about literally, probably a well, the the big one, the you know the the alpha or whatever you want to call you know the the furry mountain. Uh, yeah. I mean, you're talking, you're talking literally probably a ton of meat or more. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mom's a metric ton, man. That thing was massive. Um, oh, just the, my the heart pounded and I'm not even there. Yeah. The, the blackness of it, it, it I can't, I, I can't express that enough. The blackness of it is what was the, the thing. I don't know. You know, we can easily see how how uh, how you, you're still reacting to it. And you said it was what 15 years ago. You're still yeah. reacting. I mean, I, I I like I said, I was a cop. I, I I've been trained to observe body language, and you've got all the mar all the markers of somebody that's still experiencing the trauma of the event. So when I think about it, I get twitchy. I feel like a some addict or something. Cause, like I just get random twitches of like muscle memory in the moment like because uh, there was a lot of trembling going on during those quiet moments before my younger relative started re-engaging me in conversation um, in the mind it's funny when you're in those kind of traumas how they uh, certain stupid little things will, will really be on the forefront of your mind you know uh, it, it's weird well, it doesn't well, leave you. It doesn't well, leave you. It never leaves you. Yeah. No. Yeah. You were faulting yourself, you know, for shooting through the wall, dude. At that point, I would have been shooting through relatives. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, I All mean, right. just, you know, like love I because, laugh, but sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I laugh, but in a moment, uh, and I'm ashamed to say, I, I contemplated getting rid of dead weight. I was upset. No one was helping. Uh, uh, and I, I'm ashamed to say that, but in, in a brief moment, it, the the things running through your mind, uh, self preservation is so strong. Uh, like I said, every fiber of your being wants to flee your skin. Like now, it, yeah. It, if I would have chose to run, run I, I probably could have ran on the river. I was so the adrenaline dump was so. Uh, uh, there's no words for it. I, I wish I could bottle that. Uh, just the adrenaline dump. 
because uh, I've been charged by uh, 800 pound brown coastal brown bears uh, the bear control. I I never I felt intimidated and kind of like ah oh, this could get ugly. But never did I really have that. Uh, I didn't never really fear for my life. But as soon as as soon as I I, I made eye contact with this thing because. Um, it made eye contact with me and once I looked over and then it blinked and then narrowed its gaze and that's when it started moving. But this, see, again, this all happened faster than how I'm explaining it. Yeah. In a microsecond, it was, it was almost like, not that I read its mind uh, or it projected anything on me. It was a knowing. It That's what it is, like this primal knowing of, oh, that's here to eat me. Like there was no, there was no guesswork about it. It, it was all in the air. Uh, nothing had to be said. Well, I know if I'd been in that situation, I don't know what would have stopped me, but it wouldn't have been five eighths inches of plywood. And I would have went right through that door, getting out of there. Oh yeah, oh, there had there been a there had been a portly outline of me going through the wall there, cartoon style. Oh my God, dude! Damn. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was and the very, hair standing up on the back of my neck for the last twenty minutes. Oh. Yeah, and it hush, hush. My my dog took my attention. I got pit bulls here, and they start feeding on it, and they feel my anxiousness. So they every little noise are gonna protect dad. Yeah, right. Yeah, I've, I've got a pet that does the same thing. Yeah. But yeah, it, it was really feeding too. off your adrenaline. Ooh, oh my God, man! I, uh, I the ver when you sent me the the text uh, of everything that happened, I read it and just what you wrote, telling me, freaked me out. But hearing you tell it and give more detail than was in the email, dude, this is yeah. that's an incredible encounter. Oh my God! How many yeah, of the pictures do you think that were there? Um. Well, I know. Uh, I believe there was at least four of the smaller ones and that really big one. Um, but then again, uh, in that state of trauma, um, there's there's parts of it in my memory that flow smoothly, and other parts of it are like uh, individual frames, click, 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 click. Uh, so it like, hush, hush, that's enough, it's okay. Settle, settle, settle. Sorry, guys. Hey, you're you're fine. I, man, I understand exactly what you're talking about. I've been through a number of critical incidents in my career where, yeah, your memory is just like that. They're just, there's shots of action and there's snapshots of things that happen. Yeah. You've got to sort all that yeah. out in your head. Frame yeah, by I, frame. I, click, click, I, click. I totally understand what you're talking about because it's happened to me. Still. Yeah. And it's, and, and, it, I don't want to share this to scare anybody. I want people to be aware that there's a potential uh, of very bad, bad things. I, feeling like food is something that's hard to express. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't have the wounds. Uh, I, I felt like food. Uh, yeah. I was wounds for dinner. It was what... Uh, you well, probably I, were food. Yeah, at yeah. that point you, you were just on didn't menu. get there. I um uh, I, I grew up deer hunting. I've spent a lot of time in the woods. I've hunted about everything you can hunt in the middle part of the United States. But you saying you you guys were subsistence hunters, that's a yeah. whole nother level to the to anything I've ever done. Uh, you know, being in the woods oh, is a way of around. life for you guys. And for you to feel yeah. that way upon uh, upon having that encounter, that that really really kind of sets me back because that's you know, uh, uh, me being a deer hunter, uh, that makes me like a hobbyist compa mm -hmm. <laughs> compared mm -hmm. to you. So, oh, yeah, dude, we, it's, it's year round. Uh, you know, winter doesn't stop us. We'll go rabbit hunting, fox, lynx, whatever. You know, work the trap line, uh, moose hunt, caribou hunt, bear. What uh, I mean, it, it's Alaska, especially growing up in a, in a small fishing village. Um, 
you know, everything was subsistence. Then going to the grocery store was like going to Disneyland. It was like, ooh, we get some tang, you know, instead of uh, uh, walking from the mission. Yeah. Whew. Uh, man, I, I don't even know what to say. I, that is such an incredible encounter. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that you're alive. Okay, you're lucky to have gotten out of that alive. No, for sure. And, and I'm thankful I did. I, I really am. And and that, that's another part of it that really messes with me is I shouldn't have. Like, uh, if I could bring everyone into that little area in that little eight by eight, eight it, there, it just shouldn't have. I feel it should have went down different. I, I would have smashed it, took me, beat me against a tree, tenderized me and been done with it, you know, but it was I, it, 2020 hindsight now. This is all speculation, but it, it felt like they were feeding on that fear, like it was getting them drunk on power because the feeling in the air was like every every time they did something, like the running around the building, uh, a couple times they, they was like they were just hopping by, but we were so terrified. We weren't really looking to see what they were doing. We just knew they were doing stuff. Um, there were moments it felt like they were just hopping around in one area versus running by. Like, enough, enough. Calm down. Calm down. Tank is sitting here crying. Stop it. Yeah, it, it was... It, it felt like they were feeding on our fear. Well, I've, I've heard it said before that when an animal is experiencing fear, it pumps more blood into the meat, and therefore the meat tastes better. Yeah, it um, could be. That, uh, yeah, that's still, I still get really, really that's, creeped out thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's terrifying, mm -hmm. man. We we were terrifying. we were raised with knowledge of the hairy man. This uh, the hairy man being out in the woods was not a new concept to us. We've had sightings. We've had we've had them come down to the trail, look at us, and then run off. And then a little while later, we realize they're still looking at us from a different tree line. Like, but in those moments, uh, with more than just a few people. It seemed like they will run off, but circle back, like always backtrack. And an elder told me once that if you see one, that one wants you to see it. Look around because there's there's always more than just one. Well, that's that's a hunting tactic from way back. I mean, you know, get you get the attention on one creature while the others move into ambush positions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and these things have the ability to grab your attention real quick. <laughs> It would get my attention. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Uh. I can. I, I, I can see you're still clearly shook up over it. I would be too. I mean, that's that's something you you would. Yeah, well, you know, I, you I, I'm they tried to murder me, man. They they were you know, and not just me, my loved ones too. So I. I pull it upon myself because I, I, w I felt I was the one engaging in this. The others were just happened to be there, you know? Uh, that's how it feels. Yeah. That, dude, that's an amazing story. Yeah, that is, that is crazy. If, if anybody's got any questions for Fred, uh, you go ahead and post them. Make sure you put question in the comment. And uh, we'll pose those. And if not, then we will move on with some of the stories from Anna. Then we'll get back to Fred for some more stories from Alaska. Okay. So hey, if you, the, anybody has any questions, go ahead and send them in now. Or, what's uh, up, Doc? Um, DA, I sent you a private message, man. I've, I've got a bounce. Uh, my daughter just texted me from my ex's house. I got to go check on my oldest daughter. So okay, there's no, no one, problem. No one there. So, Fred, uh, stay safe, man. And, uh, Talk to somebody about that. That's the best thing I did because uh, PTSD oh, I is a, now. A, a real thing. This is for, sure. for me. Man. Yeah, I hear you, brother. Oh. I hear you. Anna, right. uh, Steve, DA, I'll see y'all next week, man. Y'all have a good night. Get your kid All right. All right, man. Okay, well, sir. okay. Thank you. Me too. Well, I, uh, 
dude. You know, uh, DA, the next time you take my butt out in the woods for something. Uh, <laughs> You're taking something gonna, bigger than a couple of pistols. We're going to go with something bigger than a couple of pistols and set it on screw you, whatever it is. You know. Well, oh, you have, have a question here. Uh, Alice B says, Fred, did you smell them? No. Um, the only prevalent smell was, was from the, all the residual gunpowder from the 12-gate shots in the, in the shack. I've been thinking about that smell, and I wonder if the stench is mainly from the females. Could be. Uh, gorillas have a mu gorillas have a musk gland where they mark their territory with it, so it could be something similar to that. Uh, Fred Greg Price in says, this, "When you when instance, you said so. murder me." <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Greg Price asks, uh, when you're when you said murder me, do you mean they wanted to just kill you to kill you, or is it defensive or some other reason? Uh, the whole thing was initiated by them, as far as my perspective goes. They they came to us. They brought that feeling with them, uh, and it was it, death. Was literally it felt like air pressure change in that room was so drastic and, and obvious like um <clears throat> uh it like like death warmed over man uh yeah. you, you, this is you know looking at it i ugh, get the creeps but it was there to kill it, they were there to kill there's no there they think didn't have a basket there was no, hey, knock, knock, how you doing, neighbor, new in town, none of that shit. It was, it, it was obvious. It was, it, it was tangible in the air that something was going to do. Do you think it was just to kill you because you were trespassing or for food? I honestly, I don't know. That's another one of those ones like, because uh, we'll touch base with friends and family up and down the New Shigak, you know, and, uh, the natives, you know, I, I'm, I'm part native myself and I, most of them are my family. They, they'll tell you, Oh, beware. There's, you know, there's been some weird stuff going on over here or there. Patches, watch out. Come on. Come on. Checking on me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Hey, no problem. But uh, if I didn't have the door would, shut, you know, my dog would be in my lap too. Right. We would just get, you know, a little heads up. Oh, you know, watch out over this way or that, or so-and-so saw one over here. Or be careful down by Henry Slough. There was one seen crossing there. You know, the words passed around amongst those who will listen, because they won't, a lot of us won't share with the white people because mm -hmm. there's mockery involved. So uh, I, I don't mean anything racial by that. I'm just... No, no, it, no, no it's, I it. get it. Uh, but... I, my my experience is not unique. That that particular one is kind of intense, and, and uh, but as far as um, their aggression, it's not unique to me. It's it's happened to several people I know. Uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I worry. I really panic inside when I think, and and I, I hear these, like uh, the lady. Uh, there was a lady I was listening to the other night she was speaking about having interactions and, and very peaceful ones at that uh, you know, i'm not here to cast dispersions but like inside me it's like you're being set up uh something ain't right uh, i feel me personally i don't feel you could trust these things as far in the way as you could shoot them uh christina brown christine brown wants to know how tall they were uh and if you could just you know like pick out ranges from the ones you saw you saw uh, the smallest one was around eight foot, and then uh, that the big one was really thirteen to fourteen foot tall. Um, I work carpentry. I I build custom homes. I'm I'm familiar with measurements. Uh, this thing was back behind that outhouse a little distance, and we could still see its sternum up to the top of its head. And grant you, it didn't look like it had a neck. Uh, it looked like rounded off uh, sheet of plywood. Uh, with a little bump in the middle for a head in the silhouette, it, but wider than a sheet of plywood. It, it was every bit of five and a half foot wide. 
the other one's um, very, very well built from what I could tell. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of looking at these particular ones during this in particular encounter. Um, but again, it, it wasn't the first nor the last. It was just the most uh, crazy, scary. Like, I, part of me wants to go back there mm -hmm. and like hang out. But like the smart side of me is like, yeah, no, no, just leave that alone. Take the L and stay the hell off the New York River, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. I'm amazed that you have the little detail that you have with it. Cause I mean, I would, maybe I'm just a coward, but I would be laser focused on de the area of operations very quickly. You know, I, uh, uh I've, uh, you, wow. you're raised to be observant, pay always pay attention around you. You look, always check your back trail. Just uh, there's, uh, the way I was raised was with certain a certain guidance from the elders as far as uh, certain things you do or don't do out in the woods. But like sure. it was everyday life, so it, it's not new to me. So um, I may take things for granted and not fully explain them. So if at any point uh, something I say may not make sense, just ask me to elaborate, and I can. Oh, no, no, no. It, makes, it makes perfect sense. It's just it different perspectives. You, know, I I was raised in Missouri, like DA. And you know when I'm out in the woods, I am the apex predator. That's that's Missouri woods. You know, even a black bear, the small black bears we have, you know, not a big concern. They're they're going to stay away from us. You know, when when you're out in the woods in Alaska, in Alaska, frequently you're not the apex predator. You <laughs> yeah. know, you know, no, you, got you, the brown you bears, lose your got, spot at the top. <laughs> yeah, you definitely I mean, definitely lose your spot. Yeah, yeah it's just a um, different world. Christine, Christine Brown asks, do you think the big one may have been trying to teach the smaller ones what to do when encountering humans in their area? I mean, since you got out okay. Um, uh, the only thing I think, uh, the only reason I think they stopped the full-on attack was the fact that I was shooting. Anytime they really did something, like outside of the running around the place to flush us out, uh, like... I was willing to engage them. Like I think because I did that, I feel had I not shot, there would have been another rock coming real soon. And I'm I'm really surprised another one wasn't, but I see it's so easy to twenty twenty hindsight and second guess things like but because I, I can't explain why there wasn't more than one rock, why more than one of them wasn't throwing rocks. Mm -hmm. And I don't know for sure that the big one did, but the feeling like the feeling I had inside from it going past my head and like everything going slow motion, like my eyes followed that thing to impact and like, and, and about the impact what's crazy about that is it, the force in which it impacted the river was so immense that that rock would have took my head off. Literally it, it, it would have ended me in an, an instant. So had I not did that step back, that rock had already been in flight from that distance from me standing up like it anticipated where I was going to be. But out of happenstance, I came up just behind where it was throwing. Like it led me a little too far. Uh, and, and by luck, I happened to move back a little bit before I stood up. Yeah, if that had hit you in the head, it would have been over. Um, oh, yeah. Zane, Zane asks, he says, any creature that walks upright has to have some tangible vibe of intelligence. Was there a sense of intelligence? Yeah, yeah. They were co coordinating hunting. Like like I said, there were sounds going on that I didn't acknowledge. They were happening, but the, the terror involved was on such a level, uh, I, I don't have words for it. Uh, it was like being stuck in the back of your head, staring out your eye holes and like fighting to control um, what your body was going to do. Yeah. Emmy asks, she says, thank you for sharing, Fred. Are you aware of anyone else going to this specific area since your encounter this uh, since your encounter? 
uh, no, it's not a well-traveled spot. Uh, all, all the fishing game, we're counting, uh, salmon counting towers were, have been moved up to, I think it's Gage Station or something like that at the uh, headwaters of the New Yukuk, right where it meets uh, Tick Chick Lake. There, there's some flying fishing that goes on, but uh, like between New Yukuk Falls and Kaliganik, because this area I'm telling you about, um, it's mass. It's a massive area. There's a chain of lakes from Malekdik, Nurka, Beverly, uh, what is the other one? Kolkuk, uh, Nuyakuk, and Tikchik before the river. Uh, the Nuyakuk is the largest tributary to the Nushgek River by volume. And um, the Nushgek River itself is like roughly 280 miles long to the headwaters up closer to Iliamna. And the Nuyakuk is a branch of the upper Nushgek, a uh, tributary of it that runs uh, towards the west, northwest. It's a vast area. Like, it's rare that people get back in there. It really is. Well, 200, 250 miles, basically, you know, up river. Um, yeah, that is, that is deeper in the bush than most people will ever go in their lifetime. Yeah. And if anyone out there in La La Land wants to look up Wood Tick Chick State Park, uh, you'll see some photos of the area. Uh, it's vast wilderness, beautiful mountains. Hush, hush, tank. Quit crying. You're okay. Uh, it, it's it's a very beautiful place. I was blessed to be raised there, and, and you know uh, we got property back there. And uh, it's just I, I want people to understand there's there's a side to this thing that you want no part of. Yeah, not even not even a sample, not even just to try to dip your toe in there just to see if you could handle it. You don't want no part of it. You really don't. That's some pretty rough terrain. Steve, I think this one's directed at you from Brian Merrick. He says, what do you mean in Missouri you're the apex predator? Your state is number 10 in sightings and encounters. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a detail that I, uh, I I just ignore. But, yeah, no, you, you're very correct. Uh, you know, I, I have the 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 uh, advantage of blissful ignorance. You know, I, uh, uh, you know I've, I've not uh, – been fortunate or unfortunate enough to have any encounters i believe they happen uh, i just believe that i that i just wasn't you know lucky lucky or unlucky enough to have one uh and and so yeah i do have that uh, it's like the you know, people that live in the in the the big cities you know, you'll look at the crime statistics of you know the per capita homicide rate is you know such and such well if you were weren't intimately involved with it you know you weren't killed or a family member or whatever you know you have the you have the illusion that you're safer than you are. And mm -hmm. I, and I think that that's the, the delusion that I'm able to live right now. You know, I, I haven't, you know, I, honestly, I, I've only had one encounter with a bear and it wasn't yeah. even in Missouri. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it was, uh, you know, like I said, I, I've got the luxury of ignorance and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, so I feel a little better you know, about it. Um, you know, I, I, guarantee to you that you if when i ever have an encounter with one of these cryptids my perspective is going to change dramatically I and uh, so. that will probably be the last time you find this white ass in the woods you know that's just <laughs> that's just just i mean that's me being truthful you know yeah but they're not just in the woods true yeah um Fred, Greg Price has a question. He said, to your knowledge, have federal authorities ever gotten involved with addressing things like that in your area? <laughs> no, they won't. They they don't. They won't even acknowledge it or uh, entertain a conversation about it. I think the federal government has known about them for a long time. And they just, they don't, they, they don't tell us the truth about what's out there. I think they're far more dangerous things than they'll ever tell us. Yeah. But, and, and these things I, I grew up knowing about them. Um, like I said, this, that encounter was most intense, but there's a, a, a litany of different things, you know, um, not necessarily seeing them, but oh, once you've felt these things, um, presence, it, it's hard to forget 
there's like a immediate recognition of oh something's different or like um like a sixth sense that just pings when uh you've been near these things and then you happen to come near them again and the air changes like for me it has every time that the air has got uh you, you've heard it before the dead quiet not a sound that that's so mm -hmm. i've had that happen to me in the woods that is yeah unnerving. very much so and yeah i, I just I, I would just hate to know what i know and not have shared this with you guys and maybe someone knows where one of these things is and they've been contemplating a, a closer interaction and do what you're going to do, but just just remember that uh, it's not all uh, picnics and rainbows. Yeah, the, uh, yeah I, I would have been shaken to my core in a situation like that. I've been in some pretty rugged territory, but in Missouri, you know, you can go into the deep woods and never be more than 10 miles from any given town. Um, <laughs> Missouri's just not got the, the, the level of, of wilderness that you have, but what you we've got some pretty hairy places, but you know, you're still no more than, you know, a dozen miles in, in, in one direction or another from a town. Um, the, as terrifying as that is, it's to, to know they're out there in the deep woods, but Anna's got some experiences that aren't even in the woods. They're much, much closer to home. Anna, would you like to tell us about some of those? Yeah. <clears throat> well, a couple of years ago, I was at our local coffee shop, and luckily somebody who knew me um, was told about a Sasquatch sighting, which was five minutes virtually away from where we were sitting. So I called up another Squatcher that lives near me and asked if he'd like to go and have a look-see. Now, we live in a city, and I live right downtown. My street is the main street. So if you're cruising, you're, you're coming down my street. And uh, we went the very next day, and this was in uh, late April, early May. So the ground is still pretty hard, and... Uh, there's not going to be any footprints by humans anywhere. And Sasquatch was seen by a trucker leaning on a light pole, watching the traffic go by. So Buddy comes the next day. We immediately drive to the Naval Club, which is where Sasquatch was seen. And of course, there's no print because the ground is still, like I said, really hard. But I remember there's a little creek about 30, 40 yards from the pole where he was standing. So I said, let's take a walk down and through there. And sure enough, that's the picture I showed you or you have there of Sasquatch in the water. Now he was... 18 inches footprint. That's a big print. And mom's print came in at nine. Then, of course, we had, uh, I was guessing a three-year-old maybe or two-year-old because of obviously the print I got this year. And then a baby three-year-old print. Now, the picture... Um, what I didn't send you was the picture of the blue orb we got in the middle of the forest, along with all the other structures. Mm -hmm. Now, when we went in, I said, if I take a picture, you take a picture. That way we can collaborate each other's pictures when we get home. So, of course, I upload mine first because he's got a half hour drive. And while we're going through the park, this is about 11, 30, 12, and families are all starting to come in. 
Now we're finding Sasquatch prints and all kinds of other things. And I'm getting a little concerned because now there's families with little kids because there's a play area and what have you. And he says just to, you know, keep it cool. So we go through the forest. And when I get home, I find a big blue round orb in one of my pictures. Now, it wasn't the sun coming down. So I sent it to him and asked him to look through his pictures. Well, unfortunately, I got booted off Facebook before I put it over to my pictures. But he got a blue orb also. Only his was square and he had Sasquatch shoulders head staring back at us. Now, neither one of us seen that blue orb. But that Sasquatch was directly staring at us. And how far from, from your house was that? Um, as the crow flies, you can get there in about 10 minutes. So it was close to town. Yes. That's kind of on the highway. But still in town. Like it still lands down street before it becomes Highway 7. And the creek that I told you that I took Buddy down to check for the footprints there runs um, west into the other little park where I got the Sasquatch burial mound, the five inch print plus the three inch print inside the five inch print and all the other pictures. And then of course, the other day I was at my dad's house cause he's in the hospital and I was checking on his place to make sure nobody had broken in. And I'm looking in the ravine. Now he lives on a one lane road mm -hmm. and uh, there was maybe four or five houses down there. And directly in front of his house is a ravine that goes down. And that same creek runs through and by his place to where the Sasquatch Mound and stuff is. Well, I'm over in the ravine looking. And by the cracky, right there at the metal girders is uh, X's, tripods, um, dry dance. So stick structures. And this is, like I said, 30 feet away from his front door. It's only a one-lane road. And that literally blew me away. And I haven't been back to get pictures. The, uh, in recent years, uh, we, uh, within the last decade or so, it's becoming more and more common uh, for, to, for people that live in, in areas that have uh, a lot of wildlife in the area. Uh, I know here in Springfield, it's fairly common. Uh, we see what normally you wouldn't see in town. I mean, you know, of course, you get your raccoons and possums, but it's very common to, to have deer in town. In fact, they got to be such a nuisance here in town that the city of Springfield was issuing limited permits for certain people that with the right training to call some of the deer in town. Um, because they were becoming a traffic hazard and nuisance. Uh, there's also been recent reports of seeing black bear and mountain lion in town. Oh, yeah, Springfield is the third bear. largest city in Missouri. It, to me, it would just follow suit that if these animals are coming farther and farther in toward people and may, perhaps even losing their fear of humans, that might correlate to other animals as well, especially Bigfoot type creatures. Mm -hmm. Because I've heard numerous reports of people that have that not only lived in town but lived pretty far in town uh, and had decided creatures rummaging through their trash or in their yard. Oh yeah, well, we and got... we're, we're seeing it everywhere. Like you know, Missouri, Springfield, you know, one hundred sixty thousand people who got mountain lions. You know, our uh, our friend of the show, their uh, DA, you know, Jonathan uh, Mayberry. Mm -hmm. You know, he lives in Del Mar. You know, you're talking a a, a, a you know very developed, wealthy subdivision, if you will, of San Diego. And he's got mountain lions in his parking lot. Mm -hmm. 
you know, San Diego isn't exactly like, you know, Tombstone. It's a, <laughs> it's a big ass town. Yeah. Mm, like I said, I walked out my laneway onto King Street, which has the post office on the corner and a parking garage for all the downtown shoppers. And there on King Street, I found a little X. And then in town? Course, yeah. And then we've got the mutilated bird. Mm -hmm. I think I've got it, that picture of that one. That was directly across the road from me. And that was, like I said, um, all I do is walk across the road, go down the laneway. And that was in a parking garage. And I was lucky to have the camera. And I wish I'd have gone back and picked that up and had it studied and the area studied. There's a town in Oklahoma. I can't remember the name of it. A uh, small town that uh, Bigfoot were actually becoming a nuisance coming into town raiding trash cans. Uh, it was a, an account I read, I believe. I think, I think it was on the Bigfoot Outlaws channel. Uh, I will have to see if I can find that again because they said which town it was. And Oklahoma's not far from me. I'd like to take a trip down there. I sent that mutilated picture to uh, Chase, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did she have to say about it? Well, she was quite interested, but she thought it was a recent picture and wanted to come. And I said, sorry, Chase, it isn't recent, but she agreed that it was definitely not a predator kill. Mm -hmm. if, if you guys will excuse me one second, I need to use a little boy's room. I'll be right back. I'm, I'm not right. disconnecting anything. But, okay. uh, Thank you, sir. No it is surprising that we know the same. Some of the same people. Chase Klauski, Race Hobbs. Race, Race and Chase. Uh, uh, I, I met both of them at uh, the Ozark Mountain uh, UFO Festival down in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And, uh, and did was you a guest know on Roy KGRA. Did you know Royce as well? Yes. For God's sake. And not too many people remember him. Mm -hmm. When I mention his name, they look at me like, huh? Yeah, that, that was that was some years ago. Well, uh, that, Lenita, like, say, yeah. says, Lenita says they certainly do raid trash cans. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, Sasquatch will, will virtually do anything. And, and, and like I mentioned there about the females stinking more mm -hmm. than the males. Yeah, it could be we, a pheromonal we, thing. Yeah, we have periods every month, right? So does the female mm -hmm. Sasquatch. And, of course, they don't bathe. So that is literally permeating into their fur, their body, because it literally, I imagine, just runs down their leg as they wander through the forest. So I would think they would be the stronger stench yes. between the two. Uh, Sir Blackwood says, have you guys ever heard about the 12-foot-tall Bigfoot and Mountain Giants? Uh, yeah, the uh, the I don't know if you caught the earlier part of the show, but Fred was talking about one of the ones in his encounter was well over 13 feet tall. Uh, especially up in Alaska, we get the reports of the mountain giants and the the 12, 13, 15 feet tall Sasquatch. Uh, so yeah, those those stories do filter in. Sorry for the interruption, there, guys. No problem at all. Happens to the best of us. I, I pound down the coffee on the air, so I may have to slip out myself before long. <laughs> That's why there's two of us. There's one to manage uh, potty duty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can we can cover in shifts in case one of us has to step out. <laughs> I, I would have let one guys. of my dog speak, but they're not much for conversation. I love it. <laughs> You know, the, if, if the DAX Machina thing ever, never works out, DA, we've always got, you know, two middle-aged guys, large prostates. You know, <laughs> it'll be a hit. <laughs> the, the tag team bathroom channel. Yeah. Um. Have you guys ever um, 
noticed mounds of soil in the forest or dirt? I haven't around. seen any, but there are reports of, of mounds in Missouri all over the place. In fact, if you go up uh, north of St. Louis, up into Cahokia, Illinois, there's the Cahokia Mounds up there, and uh, no, no. They, they are massive. No, no, I mean little piles, like little sporadic, okay. like little pailful piles, sporadically all throughout the forest. I haven't run mm. anything like that, not that I, mm. not that I recall. I've seen termite mounds, but that's about it. Because a buddy of mine who is a squatcher in Colorado finds them quite a bit. And, of course, I got thinking about why. Where's the soil coming from? Where's the dirt coming from? Mm -hmm. And, of course, they're building underground tunnels. In the I, think, I think it's likely that they're very subterranean. And Missouri is riddled with caves. In fact, if you look at the uh, David Pilates missing four one one, what's that? What was that, Fred? Oh, I was I was gonna say same with the area, uh, like the Wood River Mountains. Uh, all the mountains all around there all have different types of cave networks in them. None that you could really notice um, unless you know where they are. But the, those are places that uh, you notice in in a small Piper Cub as you're flying by and just kind of circling around to check caribou movement you know it's not somewhere you go oh i'm gonna i go camp over there and check that out that none of those places have that kind of friendly vibe like hey come explore <laughs> yeah i've i've found some caves that just gave you the heebie-jeebies and it's probably not the place you wanted to go go crawling in and i I've, I've been in a lot of caves but i i have encountered a number that just you know i probably don't want to go in there uh, but Missouri's riddled with them. And if you look at the David Pilates Missing 411 Can-Am project, so many disappearances occur around these cave systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and subscribe to the channel, that. too. It's crazy. A lot of missing people. I mean, even up here, there's anywhere from 500 to 2,200 people go missing a year up here. Uh, at the Alaskan Triangle uh, is one of the one of the – one of the places, one of the most active places for disappearances in the world per capita when you look at the, the population. And you've yeah, got we just shy of, Right. And we just got shy of about a half million overall population in the state. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's far more trees. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sir Blackwood asked, any thoughts about the devil monkeys? I, I don't know too much about them. Uh, I haven't heard any encounters in our area. The, I've heard of uh, encounters in the Florida area and then, then some out in California, but I haven't heard any encounters in our area. That's not something I've, I've, I've dug much into, but it's something you know I could probably dig into for a future show. Yeah, I've, I've never heard of any uh, any tales of devil monkeys. I mean, the different cultures up here um you know they have their their own versions of, of cryptids as you call them um mm -hmm. but uh like a lot of my relatives um in the bristol bay area the missionaries came in and um any any of the children caught speaking yupik or um using their their drum knives they make little wooden knives Knives that they tell story stories with. Anytime they get caught using those kind of things, they would catch a ruler across the knuckles. Like they would, uh, they would try to beat the savage out of uh, out of the indigenous people. So, uh, portions of like the, the stories, like uh, I used to hear when I was young, because uh, there were still remnants of uh, you know scary stories so to speak like the little people or you know things mm -hmm. of that nature um a lot of a lot of that heritage of storytelling or passing along certain things was kind of uh, really augmented with the the missionaries coming up and um and how the indigenous were treated as far as their, their schooling system and what they were trying to trying to do so uh, we weren't necessarily raised with uh, constant stories of, of the hairy man you know, up here it was more you know don't don't keep your back to the big woods kind of thing always you know never go alone 
always check your back trail. Just standard. I mean, a lot of hunting stuff, really. Uh, common sense out in the woods, keep yourself safe type thing. Um, never any double monkeys, though. Yeah. Sounded like double monkeys, but uh, yeah, there was no tails involved. Uh, Lanita Bryant says, does anyone have any info info of basketball size holes dug into the side of hills? I've seen at least 20 on a hill. It could have been geologists taking core samples. Those happen all over the place when they're looking for different minerals. Um, may not be anything cryptid related at all. Um, John Doe says, also note that in most mythologies, the little people, trolls, and giants all live underground. And that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And your yeah, comment, we, your comment about the native children. Uh huh. I wrote I wrote a beautiful poem for all the children they've been finding throughout oh, the state in, and in Canada. Canada. And yeah. you saying the savages. That's exactly one of the words I wrote in my poem. To describe yeah, um, the white man's idea of the native. Yeah, it was more uh, uh, arrogant misunderstanding of who really had knowledge. Uh, yeah. I talked to an elder. Uh, she was 96. This was almost two weeks ago. Since reliving this memory and trying to, uh, this is like therapy for me talking to you guys about this. So I appreciate it let you know you allowing me to share with others um she was telling me that uh back in 1935 just about to turn eight and she was just she was the oldest daughter so she, she was just old enough to go with her dad and uncle to their uh trapping cabin for the season for the winter and uh you know of course she didn't have to and the hides, hang them, you know, stretch hides, all, all that kind of stuff. And uh, they didn't have snow machines. They had dog sled teams. So they took two sled teams about 20, 25 miles north northwest of uh, non Dalton. There's a valley there uh, to their cabin. And they were about five days into this trip. Uh, each dog sled team had uh, six to eight, eight dogs. And, uh, on the fifth day, they were checking the trap line, her and her dad, and her uncle was checking a, a separate trap line because they would, you know, try to get as many furs during the season as possible. Well, she told me that this, on the fifth morning, it was the second morning they actually had traps overnight, and they were checking for the second. Uh, every animal that, or every trap that had had an animal in it, whether it be a marten, a rabbit, whatever, it was uh was ripped in half and ground and the trap and the uh little run up in the trap box was all smashed up and so uh she said it looked like someone with snowshoes on had been in the area the whole area was just covered in what she it, what looked like snowshoe tracks and uh, so while her dad was uh checking out the tracks trying to see where they you know came out of them or whatever um because initially they thought uh, another trapper was sabotaging their line trying to scare them out of there you know and uh she was picking up the chunks pieces and the broken traps to throw in the sled and they heard uh three shots which is a universal help me signal uh yeah. in the bush at least up here it uh, is here it too. was uncle and so they got, got on the dog sled team and started heading towards the uncle's trap line. And as they, uh, uh, both trap lines originate from the cabin. So to get to his trap line, I had to come back to them and cut down the other trail. And uh, she said that by the time they had been to make the turn to go uh, see what was going on with her uncle, they had already heard several other shots in the distance and at that point, he, their uncle was, or her uncle was coming towards them, so they got out of the way and uh, led the dog sled team over, uh, putting them onto their their runners because they had uh, almost enough little dog houses for their dog, 
dog sled teams, but with the, bringing extra dogs in her that year, they they were like four shots on dog houses or something like that. And one of the dogs on his team that as they, they were coming back towards the cabin was dead and just getting drugged. And, or actually, two of them were killed and being drugged. And uh, the uncle was flipping out, screaming, you know, Chikayok's coming, Chikayok, which basically translates monster, uh, is coming, uh, you know, help me, help me. And he was panic stricken. Uh, they chained up what dogs they could, and they were listening in the distance, hearing something. Uh, just watch out, baby girl. No, no, busy. Sorry, dog interrupting me. No problem. Uh, no problem. So they heard it coming in the distance, thrashing and making all sorts of weird noises. Uh, they couldn't fit all the dogs into a, on a little dog runner in the house, so they brought four of them in the cabin with them and buttoned down the hatches, so to speak. They both had rifles ready. And they never saw anything initially, but there was a, a pile of firewood next to the tree line just under the limbs of the spruce trees as kind of like a snow guard keep the snow off the top of it. And uh, one of these things was chucking pieces of that uh, wood at the cabin. Like, uh, constantly, she said, for, for a good little while. And then they heard it scream and leave the area. And uh, it had been, according to her, it had been a, quite a bit of time. The sun was setting. And they didn't feel safe to get the dogs to a, a sled and reattach to get the hell out of there at that moment. So they had to uh, stay inside the cabin. She said just before it got really dark, uh, they heard it screaming again on the other side of the cabin. And then they started hearing dogs yelp. And uh, this thing was killing the dog, ripping it in half, and throwing the pieces of dog at the cabin. Uh, I can only imagine what, what that was like, but what was uh, they because it left the area that evening and they didn't hear it the next morning and they were able to kind of make a break and get out of there but what really tripped me out about her telling me the story she's 96 she was like eight when this happened and she had a, a small quilt she made from those bits and pieces of torn mountain and, and um ermine and, and whatever else they were trapping and I looked at it, it about the size of a baby blanket a little bigger and it definitely had age to it but it really like brought her story she told me to life looking at this little quilt it was like Ugh. yeah sorry I went off on oh, a no, tangent no problem that, that's an mind. awesome story that's, a, that's another violent encounter I mean Oh, I, I don't know of any positive ones. I, I don't, and, and I'm not trying. I, I'm biased. I, I I got no use for these things. I know they're real. I don't need proof. I don't need. I don't need a casting of a track. I don't need, need any of that. Uh, it, it's beyond that for me. Uh, I, uh, yeah. And as yet, I've never been afraid, but the time will come. Well, you know, just like it's just like a grizzly bear. You can encounter a grizzly bear multiple times in the woods and it will just go its own way. But you uh, you catch one when it's hungry or getting ready for hibernation or it's got cubs. And that's a different story entirely. That's like that, that, uh, the grizzly man that was killed several years ago. You yeah. know, he had had all these peaceful encounters for months until he became food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he pushed his luck. That Timothy Treadwell, uh, God bless the dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was misguided with uh, his assumptions, and I, and I want to. That's why another. This is like a PSA moment. Attention, ladies and gentlemen. It, there's a serious danger. Uh, very, very so. real. It's very serious danger. Yeah, I. Uh, you know, I. I was a biologist before I was a nurse, and and I I love all life and 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 all critters, and and I don't want to kill any critters. You know, I, I, I've never been in a position where I had to hunt for subsistence, you know, but I am a meat eater. You know, when that time changes, I will hunt, you know, and, and do whatever it takes to support my family. But, you know, I don't want to encounter these things because I don't want to be put in a position where I have to kill them or be killed. You know, 
it, it, if they, so to speak, stay on their side of the fence and I stay on mine, well, we can coexist, but I'm not going to go looking for them. Uh, I just, you know, I, I, I've got that innate fear of the unknown, I guess, and I just don't want to mess with it. Just about any animal can be dangerous under the right circumstances. Wild animals are just that, wild animals. Oh, Even if, you piss off the wrong house cat. if you piss off the wrong house cat, oh, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look fast. how many people are killed every year by moose. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. I know the guy that took the video of that poor gentleman coming out of the, I think it was Bank of America in Anchorage. Uh, city of Anchorage, you know, he, he comes out of the bank and someone had pissed off this uh, female moose with snowballs. And this guy came out not paying attention. And this cow moose was right there and just stomped him to death on the spot. Yeah, moose are very yeah. dangerous. Yeah. And I'd rather deal with predator. Yeah. Coastal brown bears, uh, they, they get so big. See, there's so many resources up in this area. That it's the largest return of uh, red salmon in the world. Millions and millions of sockeye salmon and various other species are all over in these waters that, that I'm to these places I was. There's mm -hmm. there's boot sources everywhere. You got, got the porcupine herd of caribou. Monster moose, humongous moose, coastal brownies, black bears. It, it's it really is a wilderness paradise. There's this uh, certain feelings, like all hunters, I'm sure you've you've been in the woods and and something just didn't feel right and, and you didn't go with it. And sure enough, it was something now to the level or degree of how bad that feeling turned out to be. I'm sure it varies, but like. After the experiences I've had, you immediately, that feeling is is so ingrained, you don't even realize it. So, like, I feel that some people that have had a negative experience with these things are far more susceptible to have at least other uh, sightings of them because they can feel their presence. Like, uh, it's hard to explain. Um it's like a certain knowing, uh, feeling in the air. Yeah. Hush, dog, your dogs worry about you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I relive things in my mind, I have a very vivid memory. So um, I, I literally like relive it in my mind. And so my heart rate goes up. I, I get all clammy and sweaty, and then I'll get the chills and just uh, it. No good feelings about it. Yeah, dogs can sense when you're under stress. I know my mine does all the time. Yeah, they're a bunch of clowns. They're good. They're good. They're good. they're just good to have around. Absolutely. You know, pit bulls get a bag. These are just big babies. Yeah, I agree. Mine, big, mine's the same. Yes. Mine's the same way. He's just a big goofball. And I had a pity too. Yeah. And mine was the brains of the family. <laughs> mine think they are. They only oh, think. Mine, mine was. He knew how to tell time. I owned a restaurant, and he used to sit underneath the takeout window, growling at customers because he thought they were going to get me. <laughs> so I had to ground him and told him he wasn't allowed to come down until 8 o'clock closing time. And you know he come down every night at 8 o'clock and I never showed him a watch. I didn't tell him what time <laughs> 8 o'clock was. But at 8 o'clock yeah. he would come down. Like clockwork. Yeah, they're, they're Pit pretty bulls. smart. Pit bulls are, are the best dogs going bar none and I don't care what anybody says. Richie Evans says, I'm a hunter, and after I had my encounter, I can only go to my tree stand at 5 a.m., more like first light now only. <laughs> well, I don't blame you, man. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah, walking through the dark woods, especially when it goes quiet, that is a very, very 
enlightening <laughs> sensation. You, if you're in the dark woods, going to your tree stand and the woods go dead quiet. Yeah. You, you're going to know what fear feels like. Cause that is terrifying. Yeah. You know, for me, um, I've never, I'm still not scared of the dark, uh, but the only thing I am scared of is when I get that feeling of that, that, that presence, uh, like I said, unless unless you've been traumatized the way I have, it's hard to explain. It's like a muscle memory thing. Your your subconscious picks up on it immediately, and like red flags will will just start going off all over. Like ah, I'm not going to go over there, and I'll uh, yeah. you know I'll pick berries over there. Uh, up until that point, I would not really pay attention to that, uh, that inner voice, but since that experience in 06 i won't do nothing but go by that inner voice i, I don't ignore it or mm -hmm. yeah, you know because a lot of people might think oh well you had guns you could make a stand and, you know you get them and I, I didn't have that feeling i only had the feeling of i need to get the hell out of here and i need a, I need a bigger gun <laughs> that survival <laughs> instinct is 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 intense You've ever you've ever experienced that fight or flight that moment when you know this the next few moments are going to either end badly or you're going to have to fight your way out. That that's a feeling that sticks with you, and I've had many times in my career I've had that feeling, knowing that you know fighting your way out's the only way out, and it's 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 a terrifying feeling. Yeah, uh, another real scary feeling is knowing they're right over there and not being able to see them because they're staying in cover, but they will be like hooting like an owl with the simultaneous clicking and um, mm -hmm. the bird whistling, uh, little things being thrown just the, ah, it's just so creepy. Um, yeah. There's just Christine uh, Brown uh, says, says I, I used to go hunting with my ex to different tree stands. Sometimes I had be bad feelings walking back to the point where I would go back to the truck. I was noping out of there. I can't say that I blame you. Yeah, not at all. Stick with that. Go with those feelings. Uh, uh, from my, I'm 46. I've, I, I'm not really that old, but the life experiences I have had uh, always, you, you got to go with that feeling because uh, when you don't like it, now, don't get me wrong. This was thrust upon us. This situation we went through. Um, from the moment that place creaked, everything changed. So it's not like we had warning or, or went in there looking for these things. You know what I mean? It, it's just, just something that right place, wrong time, uh, wrong place, right time. I, I don't know. It, it is. I never had I, uh, the urge of looking for him again or at all. I went, with a, I went with a buddy of mine one time out into the Mark Twain and we were looking for new places. We were trying to scout places to hunt that year. And it was, it was, it was a uh, conservation land, but we were, you know, we had permits to be, be on the land. Um, and we went down, I parked off the side of the road and we went traipsing down through the woods and uh, we were back in there for a couple hours and, didn't see any any sign of deer at all in the area, which was odd. We're like, well, okay, well, this is probably going to be a terrible place to hunt. We're going to have to find someplace else. And we got back to my truck, and there was a pile of pine cones on the hood of the truck, but there wasn't a pine tree within 100 yards of my truck. Oh, yeah. Sasquatch was gifting you cones. I, I, I can't say for sure what did it, but I know we both looked at that and went, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> Right. You know, um, back when this happened, there was uh, all this big, big, Bigfoot stuff wasn't mainstream at all. Mm -hmm. um, but seeing some of the, the programs that come out and uh, some of the documentaries, you, you can easily tell those who are really into it and those who are uh, kind of fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. And watching those those documentaries and what those people are doing, like, I've never had to hunt for these things. Uh, I, I know the areas they are. I, I don't have an interest in uh, like going squatching. Yeah. Uh, we, we saw one. Um, and if I do, uh, it, like I said, heavy caliber, uh, high velocity, 
the multiple round mag. Um, we were on the Manicotic Trail coming back from Manicotic Twin Hills area uh, by four wheeler back to Dillingham. And um, going across the muskegs on this particular trail we we're on at the time, you have to stay on the trail because uh, certain parts of that muskeg, if you break through, you're losing your four wheeler. Uh, you ain't. And uh, so as we're going along, uh, a good family was on the four wheeler in front of us guiding us well so what happened they kind of started to plunge into a little bit of a hole and stopped so the whole line of us had stopped behind there's about uh seven four-wheelers and about 11 people total because there's some doubled up riding going on and uh we were younger we we're uh late teens early 20s but uh about 100 yards off to our right out in the middle of the muskeg uh one of the younger kids that was with us said Oh, uh, Chicago, Harry man, Harry man. And we all turn and look. And sure enough, it was, uh, it looked like a oversized Chewbacca, real wide shoulders. And uh, every bit of eight, nine foot tall. But it was just standing there. It, it was like, uh, like, it was just there. And uh, it kind of turned its shoulders towards us. And it, it made a sound that would sound like a tree knock. It's sound like two Louis, like crack, but it, it made it with like a tongue pop. And uh, it did it a, a couple more times. And then uh, we didn't do, we had firearms and everything, but we were just kind of awestruck. It like, oh crap, look, look at that, you know? And uh, it screamed at us. And then it, it ran across the, uh, the clearing of that muskeg to the tree line. And it's real marshy and wet. It, it, I swear it looked like a rooster tail off the back of this thing, how fast it was moving. Like, almost like it was at any second going to transition to fours, but it, it didn't. Kind of like you'd see a tractor starting its run. And yeah. Uh, yeah. It, that was surreal. Like, uh, it was awe inspiring, though, the, how fast. Uh, Cause we're ripping in front of the windows. That was just a, a brief second of what the, what the hell. But this thing, and it was broad daylight, middle of the day. And uh, what's funny is we didn't look behind us. But no sooner than it ran off, we scream about, about three to four hundred yards into the trees, back off on the left hand side behind us a little ways. So, yeah, I mean. I don't want to make it sound like everywhere we go back home, you're just going to, you know, be in a life that struggle with some, some, some Sasquatch. That's not it. It's just, I feel that when they're, they're around, uh, they're not going to just go run away. They may run off, but they always, they're always going to circle back and there's always more, more than one, mm -hmm. at least up here. That, uh, yeah, sorry, that makes I, perfect sense. I mean, thoughts. oh, no, you're fine, man. That makes perfect sense that, you know, considering the presence of grizzly bear and other large predators in Alaska, that they would travel in groups. I mean, just for safety's sake. Yeah, the last bear I, I trophy hunted for uh, was in 95, and it was 10 foot squared out. Um I shot that with a 338, one shot, one kill, you know, and uh, it, it bothers me that I shot this thing and it, it didn't flinch. Like, you know, I've heard a lot of speculation, you know, muscle density, bone density, and this and that. I, I get that, sure. But, but I don't know. It, it just, it's real creepy that, I mean, it, it just, it took it like nothing, like nothing. Yeah, I think they're I think they're incredibly thick muscle and thick bone. I think they've got to be very dense. Anna, there's a question yeah. for you from Mrs. Chef Yoda. She says, Anna, how many personal encounters have you had? Hmm. Well, I don't know, because since the one park when we realized he was interdimensional and looking at us, but we weren't seeing him, it's gotten me to thinking how many times He's been right there around me, but I didn't see him or didn't know he was even there. 
Mm -hmm. So God only knows. I know um, when we found the, the little five inch print with the three inch print inside, just before that, before we found those, those prints, my buddy said to me, how come every time we go squatching, we never find footprints? And I swear to God, within two minutes, there were these set of footprints. And that picture I showed you of the branch laying in the middle of the path, mm -hmm. when we came in that park that day, that limb or branch was not there on that path, but it was there when we were leaving. And there was an old couple sitting, I swear to God, 10 feet away from this branch. And we were only in the park 45 minutes. So when did Sasquatch pull that branch out of the tree, lay it in the walkway, but yet this old couple be sitting there? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, nobody really knows. He could be there looking at you, and you're standing there wondering where he is. Yeah. And I've seen video of uh, interdimensional um, things where you see half a deer, but the other half isn't there. I've seen video of Sasquatch. Half of him mm -hmm. is there. The other portion isn't. He's in between rows. So God knows really how many encounters each or any one of us have had, really. Yeah, when you look at it that way, you, you're, you're uh, very correct. You don't really know. He could be beside you all the time, but you mm -hmm. don't see him. Very true. It's crazy how that that works. Mm -hmm. You know, and people say, well, how many have you seen? But nobody could really say for sure. Because you could be looking right at them, but not know it. Like buddies, our blue orbs. Sasquatch is literally staring at us. And our cameras are literally looking at him. But neither one of us seen him looking at us, but there it is in the picture. And of course, it was Chase, I think, that started talking about Sasquatch being interdimensional. And I always thought it was hogwash because yeah. this is their house, their territory, and we know ourselves, if an intruder's coming in our house, we're going to lock all the doors, shut all the lights, bust any light bulbs where anybody can naturally assume there's going to be a switch, right? And in the darkness, we can hide in our own home. But when we're in Sasquatch world, that's his house. And I, yeah. always, thought, I always thought he went straight up. And that's why nobody could find him because everybody was looking out. But then when we seen got that picture of him staring at us and only from here up looking at us, then I had to admit, okay, he's interdimensional. I couldn't deny it. The picture was proof. You know, I had to admit to that, but now I'm still on the edge as to are all of them interdimensional or or only a certain few me yeah, I, I don't know anything about that i i wish they would have disappeared i tell you that much uh i haven't seen anything like that everyone i've seen uh, uh, they they weren't necessarily going anywhere Stop. Stop. Well, this was the big boy that was looking at us, and I imagine it was the 18-inch print that was staring at us this way. Yeah, up in uh, Sunshine Valley, uh, northwest of Aleknagik, on the far end of Aleknagik Lake, is uh, Sunshine Alley, and there's some 
some creeks way back up in there. We were uh, scouting for some caribou, and we came across some tracks that were every bit of 24 inches long. Uh, they were a good foot, maybe 14 inches wide. Uh, they were really, really massive. Um, they, they didn't have a whole lot of detail other than you could see it had, you could see the line, but they, it wasn't really defined uh, because it was partially gold and sandy silt where it was walked along this creek. And uh, the tracks just went right on up that up that way, and it happened to be the way we wanted to go initially. But when we saw that, we, you know, it wasn't in our culture to cast it or take a picture because, you know, that just wasn't on our radar. We were, we were out to do one thing. Once we saw that, we're like, okay, well, you know, mental memory, you know, back over there, you may want to, you know, not necessarily be over that way. Yeah, but see, you say you won't go this way and you, you switch to this way, but they're also over there too. Yeah, well, fair enough. But, but uh, I, for me, it's the visual confirmation that I know that happens if we went over there. So, uh, you know. It's all a roll of the dice, I agree, but, uh, yeah, I, I go by what I feel in the moment, not necessarily what I, I may see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was a uh, Meg Mills had a question for you, Fred. She said, have you any had, had any other encounters with other cryptids or paranormal? Uh, yeah, on the Nushadek River by the, uh, the tidal zone, which is where the ocean water and the fresh water mixed during the night. Uh, we got stuck on a little uh, gravel bar when we were in a skiff coming up for moose hunting in 98. And uh, it was just three of us, me and my dad and my cousin Jason. And uh, we made it to this place called Black Bluff in Angel Bay. And uh, as we're sitting on the sandbar, because it's tidal, so we're waiting for the tide to come in to where we have enough water to float and then continue on up and it was pitch black out and we we're kind of looking up at the stars and about three bends up river and we know this because this bright light like someone was spotlighting the shore right uh, which back then a lot of people would hunt their moose that way you know just drift down and spotlight and then you see eye shine of a moose shoot it and my hunting's over it, it real weak way to do it but anyway uh, we assumed that's what it was, but this light was so bright, and uh, we watched it moving down the river, all three bends, and just as it was about to clear the bend where we could see the source of the light, it went out, and immediately just, just below us out of view, that light was back on and continuing down the river. And it, it was the damnedest thing, because we figured it was someone drifting, and with that bright of a light, they can spotlight for us and we could see the channel, get off the sandbar and get on up to where we wanted to get. But uh, we're just kind of dumbstruck by that. And then uh, we sat there about another half hour, 45 minutes, and finally the, the tide shifted and we were able to float again and, and push off the sandbar. And uh, we put it on up to Black Bluff to uh, grab some firewood because we're going to stay in, in Angel Bay on this little island and just build a bonfire and wait for daylight. Well, no sooner than we uh, got to the beach to grab some driftwood, uh, that bright light was above us just out of sight on top of the bluff. Now, uh, my dad's a Vietnam vet. He, he, he's an excellent shot and all that, but he prefers not to pick up weapons. It's just, you know, he's over it. But uh, he immediately was like, load the guns, get them ready. And uh, so when I heard him say that, it, it creeped me out because I've never seen him like respond with that kind of uh, instant, get the gun ready. You know, it was, you know, always be safe with a gun, shoot what you mean, you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, that was real creepy because there's no sound to the light. It was just bright. Um, I know my aunt had some issues with, with the, the little people uh back when she was younger uh some of those stories have uh been lost over the you know the addles of time 
Uh, but it boils down to uh, little people in the woods. You don't follow them because you, you won't you won't come back. Uh, uh, and some of the other stories I remember hearing some stuff when I was really young, but uh, nothing I really held on to. Like I said, uh, there was a lot of stuff that was uh, frowned upon, you know, at the missionary schools and stuff. So a lot of the uh, Verb, some, not all, but a good portion of verbal history, uh, the way they used to pass it down was uh, either altered or lost. So uh, I've only heard of the the one thing about the little people and then those weird lights, that, that bright light. But every, everything else had been uh, Harry Man related. Uh, see them at a distance, they whistle to get your attention. Uh, you know, a good good portion of the time they'll they'll keep their distance, but it, it always ends up being trying to force you out. Uh, always coming at you in one way or another, and then of course the the progression of that was what happened at that shack. But yeah. it wasn't the the first time we were hunted. That the following year, um, I had injured my hand on the fishing boat. So my season ended early, and it so happened that a couple of my cousins wanted to go up to New Stuyahawk and um, pick one of their buddies up, but he was too drunk at the time, and the local air service wouldn't give him a ticket to fly him to Dillingham. So, you know, we went on a rescue mission to get this idiot drunk guy. But uh, <laughs> we, we left a little late from Dillingham. I'm, I'm being honest with you. It, it, that's what was happening. So we left killing him, and we we had been drinking a little bit, but we weren't on idiot level. And uh, so there's three of us. We're coming up the Nushiak River, and we're a couple miles below Ekwa. And it was getting dark, and none of us want to travel on the river in the dark. We just know better. Too, we've lost too many loved ones to those kind of stupid things. But uh, we went to the to the higher bank. Well, actually, the, both banks were about level at this point, but the side we chose had a couple sloughs that cut back, and there was a bunch of uh, beetle-killed spruce. So uh, we knew there was going to be good firewood, so we immediately we set up a little tent, little pop tent, and started this huge bonfire, and we're sipping some beers, just, you know, BSing around the campfire. And... Uh, somewhere off distance because the way the tree line is and how the little muskegs and little meadows open up and stuff, it's hard to pinpoint where sound is actually coming from. It could it sound real close, but it could have originated a hundred and some yards away or vice versa. It originated 20 feet away and it sounded like it was a hundred yards away, like depending on, you know, the direction because of the forest or whatever. But we heard this owl hoot and it sounded like a natural owl hoot, just clear as day, whoo -hoo. And uh, thought nothing of it. We're BSing around the fire. But moments later, not uh, not even a full minute, because we started talking. Hey, did you hear the owl hoot? Kind of, you know, just something to talk about, basically, around the fire, because none of us were very interesting. So uh, all of a sudden, behind us, uh, guesstimating, because like I said, it's hard to pinpoint exactly, roughly 100 and something yards behind us, we heard another owl hoot but very unnaturally loud and obviously an imitation, a good mm -hmm. imitation, unnaturally loud. And that immediately got my attention and, and me and my two cousins. And, uh, you know, <laughs> because we weren't going that far up river, uh, it just so happened <laughs> that same 30 odd six was along for the trip. One cousin had his 30 odd six, which had a 10 round box mag, a nice semi automatic 30 odd six, real, real nice gun. And my other cousin, he had a little 243. Yeah, some guys, they just, you know, oh, this is my caribou rifle, I'll kill anything with it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, anyway, um, so those are the firearms we had. But that moment of hearing that unnatural owl sound, everything became evident. Evident. Something's not right. Something is just there's something going on. No sooner than we we're 
getting grabbing firearms and kind of being more aware and kind of looking around across the river from us, which at this point is about roughly 85 yards wide uh, and a good, you know, 60 to 80 feet to the tree line off the river bank. We heard another owl unnaturally loud, so loud that we felt it like in that distance, we, we felt a concussion of it. And this was only an owl hoot, so the concussion from it was on the subsonic level to where we couldn't hear it. We, we ended up feeling it. And uh, ugh, just, uh, you know, again, I feel there's nothing good that can come of these things. There's another anecdotal reason why. Um, another volley of owl hooting starts and it's from the original spot where it sounded natural. This time, the second time, unnatural. And simultaneously a weird uh, kind of cooing, tongue clicking, tongue popping sound. Simultaneous, real, real weird. Um, and then the, the one that was behind us was a little closer. Something similar, owl hooting with a different type of click pop and what they're going on simultaneously. And then it's off across the river and out of sight of where we could see, cause this is, it's, it's starting to get pretty dang dark, but we had uh, plenty of firewood. So we got this bonfire so hot. Uh, the, the pop tent was like 12, 13 feet away from this fire and it burned one of the guide strings for it and burned a hole in it from the heat. It was putting off heat and we wanted light. Um, so we heard the one across the river run out of view uh, what we could see we could hear noise and then we heard splashing in the river now, now uh, I can speculate and assume it jumped a good distance over the, the deepest part of the channel and then splashed through uh, but this is the Michigan River it's, it's, it's pretty deep at this point um, it's not like a, a babbling brook that you could just walk across. So we heard it splash through out of sight. And about where it got to the bank, it, it sounded off like an owl over there. And then and the other the other two made the same similar noises, a lot louder and a lot more uh, quick type growl sound at the same time. Uh, explain the, the octaves in bubble on two different levels at the same time. And uh, a good few minutes has gone on, and we're, we're talking about getting the hell out of there, uh, pushing off from shore and just anchoring out in the channel away from shore and at least hear them coming in the water. Um, mm -hmm. We're all back to back right next to the fire, between the fire and the riverbank where the skiff is. And there's an open area between the tree line and the riverbank of about 30, 40 feet. You know, there's some little scrub alders, nothing over a foot or two tall. You know, I mean, I mean really nothing and some dead grass and shit. But uh, we heard heavy footsteps. Like It seemed like 25 feet away, roughly. Uh, heavy footsteps with crunching of the leaf litter and, and, and twigs. And we, we should have seen it. We, we should have seen that whatever it was. We should have been able to see it, but there was nothing. There was nothing there, um, and the creep factor was already high. It, it went up even higher because those the familiar feeling of being hunted was like back with a vengeance. Yeah. Uh, and so immediately, <laughs> we didn't need to debate anything. It was time to go. Um, the only thing we we had all the valuables mostly still in the skiff there was just the pop tent and a duffel bag with uh party supplies <laughs> inside so uh my one cousin was like i'll grab the party supplies well, let's go so we ended up uh getting in the skiff went out into the channel and anchored out straight out from where we had been kind of keeping an eye on the fire um, cause this, this was a roaring fire and we, we didn't want to be responsible for a, a forest fire. I think. Um, we heard noises off in the distance as we're out in the water 
uh, we saw like flashes of movement, but nothing we could, you know, to be, uh, put anything to, you know, as far as fire shot or getting a good look at it. Uh, we didn't physically see anything on that deal there, but um, what ended up happening is, is the screaming from that shoreline got so loud. It, it was like we could feel it in the aluminum skiff, like the reverberation was coming. After the scream would end, you would kind of hear it still in the, in the skiff, kind of wrong. It, oh, just so we pulled the anchor and drifted downstream uh, about three quarters of a mile through the anchor again. And uh, yeah, it, like I said nothing, nothing good, no good feelings, no. Um, nothing that gave, gave me any kind of reassurance of any anything. I, I uh, I don't say that I blame you. I mean, with encounters like that, I I don't know that I would see anything positive coming from an encounter either. <clears throat> it's not unique to me. I, I know I know plenty of people that have dealt with uh, similar things and never. And, and I, I think that's just due to the, to the isolation up here. There's mm -hmm. not that many people that, that get out up into those areas. Um, it is beautiful wilderness. Though. Settle down, guys. Well, folks, I hope you guys are enjoying the show tonight. We are going to be doing a giveaway here in just a minute. I am going to be giving away one of these Scallywag Tactical Hats. Has a American flag on the side. Oh, wrong side. American flag, subdued flag on the back on that, and then it says Pirate's Life on the back. So we're going to be giving one of those away here in just a minute. Just a minute. Make sure you're active in the chat because Nightbot only goes back the last 15 minutes. So if you guys want to be in on the on uh, the on winning that hat, uh, even if you just say hi, you know, type anything in the chat, but you've got to be in the chat on YouTube. Uh, for Nightbot to be able to pick you up. So make sure you're active, and we'll be giving that away here in just a couple of minutes. And uh, if you're enjoying tonight's show, hit that like and subscribe button and share this uh, share this video with your friends uh, because some of the some of the some of the uh, stories tonight are just absolutely terrifying, folks. These are this is a, a fantastic show tonight that we've had. I've got some awesome guests, and uh, I'm I'm really excited for to see to see how, how many people react to this. This one's just going to be one for the record books. First-hand encounters are always the best, and having people with actual first-hand experience telling their stories is absolutely the best. We're getting some fantastic stories tonight. Christina Brown says, do you guys have dogmen in your states? Reports are all over here in Michigan. There are quite a few sightings here in Missouri. I don't know about Alaska or, Hannah, where are you from? I'm in Ontario, Canada. And I haven't really had or heard of too many reports, and I've been paying attention. Um, um, Fred, we, have you heard of the dog man accounts? Yeah. Uh, no, but more of like uh, uh, humongous wolves, which, uh, I mean, who knows, you know? They could, could be just been on all fours at the time they were spotted, but uh, mainly uh, kind of legends of uh, massive wolves, hell wolves. Uh, a lot of the dogmen encounters, they've reported seeing them on all fours before they stood up. And, and yeah, see, that's see. what I mean. I can't, uh, I can't say yay or nay on that, but I do know there is a, a history of a uh, large wolf like uh, for sure. Uh, Meg Mills had a question for you, Fred. She says, do you feel that native Americans have a greater sensitivity to cryptid activity? I, I think that's a yes, but I think it's only due to how uh, we were raised in the woods and raised off the land. We, we didn't rely on grocery stores, so we had to really rely on our own ingenuity and uh, our, our cunning, you know, our, uh, mm -hmm. our ability to see things out of the normal and, uh, you know, that type of thing, so. I, I don't think it's just Native Americans. Because I think it's anyone who has spent a good portion of time in the woods. Uh, I, I would agree. I think it's more of a hyper vigilance than uh, being than aware of their surroundings. Else. Yeah. Makes sense. 
and you know for a couple of years after this incident um a bird could flutter in the trees and just catch my eye oh man i wouldn't like break down or cry or nothing like that but in, inside me I, I would immediately be right back staring out that window in that shack um i i am yeah you def definitely suffered a traumatic traumatic event I mean, I could I could see you know from your body language you were reliving that experience when you're telling the story, and that's that's definitely you know, like some of the symptoms of PTSD. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I I I'll freely admit that it never stopped me from going back out in the woods, but um, that along with other experiences, like I said, once once you've had any um, a multiple amount of anything bad way uh you get the that certain feeling as when it's around again so to speak uh yeah but I, get like that. I get like that when people mention ouija boards yeah oh those are who yeah I'll because pass yeah, on I, that. Had a, I had a crazy experience with one of them and anytime somebody mentions Ouija board, I get that same fear that you're referring to. Because I've yeah. had an experience nobody could explain. Even the person that was there claimed they didn't remember. Now, with what happened to me, you would have to re remember. It would be something that you would remember for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? Leaving and putting somebody on a bed and getting a Bible and folding their hands and putting the Bible in the hands. Isn't that something you would remember doing to somebody? You yeah. would think. Yeah. Well, it's like Fred's uh, relatives with the uh, the bad day at the shack. You know, yeah. uh, you know his, his, his elder and his younger uh, relative there, you know, they, they, they don't even want to talk, talk about it. it. Yeah. I know, and I got a hold of the only one person left that was alive with my encounter, and she claimed stupidity. I don't remember. Yeah. So I'm yeah, still left, out. I'm left in limbo because I don't know what happened, what went on, what were they thinking, why did they get the Bible? You know what I mean? Did they think I was dead? There's lots of unanswered questions. Like, it sounds like it. Robin, yeah. Why didn't you get up and help? Why didn't you do something? Grab your gun. Yeah. <laughs> well, folks, I'm going to go ahead and give away that hat. Uh, I'm going to have Nightbot select, one, select someone from the chat room at random. And uh, we're going to do that right now. So uh, watch the uh, watch the screen, folks, because Nightbot's going to randomly select somebody from the YouTube channel. Well, it looks like Chris Miller has won the uh, the the hat. It's a Scallywag Tactical hat, courtesy of the guys at ScallywagTactical.com. Um, you guys check out Scallywag Tactical; they make some of the best knives I've ever ever owned. Fantastic blades; they they just amazing gear, and. Uh, Chris, if you will contact me at daroberts at daroberts.net to give me your information. Here's my email, daroberts at daroberts.net. Uh, contact me at the, that email and give me your address, and I will get that hat out to you this week. Ooh. So, congratulations, <laughs> not, not, Chris. Not, not to cut you off. Uh, my phone's about to get, die here. Um, okay. I, I get going. But I, I thank you for letting me um, tell my experience and uh, some of my views on this. Well, Fred, thank you very much for joining us. It has Thanks, been a Fred. pleasure, and your stories are just absolutely terrifying. I loved hearing them. And, uh, you know, I would love to have you back sometime if you've got any other stories you'd like to tell. Uh, just oh, you've got yeah. my email. You know, just keep in touch, and I would love to have you on again. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, sign. Uh, I'll shoot you an email later. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm tired and I, I'm, I'm a little internally weirded out, just kind of dwelling on, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda in 2020 hindsight at the moment. Yeah. So exactly. But, um, well, I Fred, thank you, all Fred. Again, 
Thank you, man. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope you have a great night and be safe, man. Be safe out there. Always. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm keen on that. <laughs> All right, y'all. Y'all have a good night, and we'll, we'll talk to you later, DA. Have a great night, sir. Wait, wait. Right. Yeah, that would be scary, especially when you're in nothing but clapboard and fur. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Seriously. Who that would be terrifying. Well, I mean. <laughs> You know, I, I've been in old outhouses and things, you know, in some of my camping trips, you know, where like the outhouse door is held shut by those little J hooks with the eye hook on it. You know, you can't keep a toddler out with those damn things, let alone <laughs> whatever the hell this was. Yeah. Oh. It's got to be about 14 feet. That's a oh, big, hell. big boy. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Damn. Well, you know, and- I, I, when him telling that story, I just felt like I was there with him. Oh, I, I, I was I was envision, envisioning that as he was talking about it. I'm like, because I've camped in places like that. Uh, one one of the places we used to deer hunt up near Richland, Missouri. Our our deer hunting cabin was really nothing more than that. It was just some two by fours and some sheets of plywood. Yeah, that's. Uh, it reminded me of some of those uh, scenes that don't end too well in some of your damn books. You know, <laughs> uh, like I was telling Doc before he had to leave us. You know, it. it I was thinking of the angry snowmobile scene from Curse of the Windigo. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't care what it is. If it's you know 12 to 14 feet tall, you're screwed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because those boys can, well, just the X, the one X picture I showed you. Just picture how big that boy was to do that. Very much so. And was that X that 18 inch footer? Because that's the park it was in. Yeah. Well, what do you figure Steve, up? Can you uh, can you manage for just a moment? I, uh, I, the yeah. rent is due on the coffee. I will be right back. <laughs> uh, you know, one thing that I was thinking of, uh, Anna, was the the basketball size rock that he said that that thing threw at him. Now, of course, without knowing what kind of rock it was, we don't know the density of it. But I mean, a basketball sized rock could weigh a couple hundred pounds easily. Uh, I you know, I can't imagine something big enough to throw that. No, you know you you look at like those Scottish Highland games, you know when the dudes have got the big rocks like that, and you know there's some massive three hundred pound dudes that are struggling to lift those things. Yeah, let alone to make a weapon out of it. Awesome. Right, and they can throw them hundreds of feet and have them land like. I don't know if I've got it close by. I've got an axe that I found that belongs to somebody a little bit taller than us. Mm -hmm. And like me holding it in my hand is one thing, but to add a stick to it, attach it, the weight alone, like it's this big. Right. Well, it's like those, uh, um, I got my big comic book nut and I was watching a video of some guys and they were trying to duplicate Thor's hammer, you know, from the, uh, yeah. the, uh, uh, the Avengers films. And they made one out of tungsten, which is uh, apparently a fairly dense metal. And yeah. the damn thing weighed 80 pounds. Mm-hmm. You're, you're not swinging that around. You're, you know, you're just, you're just not, I mean, I you use a 15 pound sledgehammer for demolition, you know, and that's, you know, five tungsten times that hard steel. Cause I've got tungsten darts. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. And if I had it right here, I would show you the, <clears throat> yeah. Here's the. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah, that's solid. You know, that's a big boy. Mm Mm-hmm. And you can see that it's beveled in. But the weird thing about this axe, it's not sharp. Yeah. So I don't know if it just wasn't finished. 
or if it had a different use, hence the flat. Mm. But you can see how well shaped it is. Yeah. <clears throat> That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And this isn't something you and I would be wielding. You know no, definitely I mean? not. No. No, uh, while you were uh, uh, answering the call of the wild there, DA, we were talking about uh, <laughs> uh, the, the basketball-sized rock that yeah. um, the, the big monster threw, uh, about how much that would have weighed. You know, oh, it had to be huge. Of, I was thinking of watching you know, those, those Scottish guys doing the Highland games, you know, with the big <laughs> yeah. boulders. I, yeah. I mean, those are, you know, 300 pound dudes and, and, you know, they could barely lift those damn things. Oh yeah. Let, let alone, you know, throw it, make a weapon out of it. And it oh, literally kidding. would have crushed whatever body part. Oh yeah. Contact with. It wouldn't have had to been a headshot. The, I mean, the sheer hydrostatic shock of it hitting anything would kill you. I mean, yes, that's the end of it. Oh yeah, there's no recovering, no repairing yeah. bones because they would be just mush. They'd be mush, and, and you know, you consider the fact that they're, you know, literally 247 miles from nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one thing to get a pile of pine cones and uh, quartz placed throughout the forest, or maybe a gifting thing that they weave, but to have a basketball-sized rock come hurling at you. Mm -mm. Yeah, that, that that could have easily killed him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... No, thank you. I, no uh, kidding. Yeah, I, I... Maybe I'm just a wimp, but I'd be getting the hell out of Alaska, honestly. And it's, well, it's and that's where he was born beautiful. and raised. I mean, I can understand not wanting to leave. And it's funny, it's a beautiful country. I've played cribbage with a few people in Alaska, and I'm always squatching, no matter mm -hmm. where I'm at, am. I'm always asking, and everybody I've asked out of Alaska laugh at me. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? There's no such thing. And I was in a in a site in Alaska where it's uh, where they land planes all the time. Mm -hmm. And I guess you're not allowed to talk anything but planes. And I made the, the tragic mistake of asking has anyone ever seen Sasquatch in and around? this area while you're live streaming and i got the what for and the how to's and i thought i'm out of here you know what i mean you can't ask a simple question other than well some like, people don't don't react well to to talking bigfoot uh, same know. thing with dog man when i was in lbl i was basically kicked out of a couple stores because they they didn't they did not want to talk about it in any way, any way shape, or form. Uh, Mark Sharp, speaking of LBL, Mark Robert Sharp says, uh, a lot of storm victims here in Kentucky have been put up in the Ken Lake Resort and Kentucky, da Kentucky Dam Resort in the LBL. Very, very bad idea. Yeah, I've spent some time in LBL, and I can definitely say that is that is one of the more terrifying places I've ever been. Um, <laughs> that's, that's funny. Uh, I'm not going to read that out loud. Uh, James Fadeke says, hey, everyone, I was night fishing in a park in 2008 that I wasn't supposed to be in after dark. Me and a buddy got trapped on a peninsula by a possible young Bigfoot killing a deer on the right, right on the left. Wow. Dude. Wow. That, that, I'd like to hear that whole story. James, if you want to reach out to me on my, my email, daroberts at daroberts.net, I'd love to hear the whole story and possibly even have you come on and tell it. Um, Robert Sharp says, and they have found a little 14 year old girl, girl torn up in Moss Creek at the LBL this morning. They said it was a tornado, but I wonder why they're still investigating it. You know, that's the weird thing about when people go missing in LBL, they shut it up immediately. Uh, I, I read one story of a guy that was found and they called it an animal attack. 
and they, they did like a one paragraph story on it. And, it, and and at the end of the article, it literally said, this is not a cover up. Don't ask. I'm like, why would you put that in the article? Because it's not a cover up. So don't right. ask. It's completely not a cover up. <laughs> That's not suspicious at all. Yeah, no, no. not at all. No. That's like a, you know, when my son tells me a story about what happened to his homework. He always adds, well, I'm not making this up. Okay, I never said you were. <laughs> Why are you so paranoid that I think you're making it up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, James Fadeke says the mom was on the left. Dude, I, I would love to hear that whole story. Wow. Uh, and, and if you wanted to come on the show sometime and tell it, we would love to have that happen, man. So shoot me an email and uh, we'll uh, we'll discuss it and possibly get you on an upcoming show. Because uh, I love having these first-hand encounters. Uh, they, someone, they, they're, uh, they're awesome. Someone What's that? on Facebook posted a picture of uh, a Sasquatch sitting on a, on a log. And, of course, huh. everybody's commenting on the Sasquatch sitting on the log. So all you can see is kind of the side view and the front of the log and the ground in front of that. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody's looking at the Sasquatch on the log, but not paying attention to what's at the end of the log. And there was a baby sitting on the log. And I'm looking at the picture and I thought, what the heck? And I read everybody's comments and they're all talking about the Squatch on the log, but nobody's seen the baby sitting in front of the log on the ground. <laughs> yeah, can you send me a link to that picture? As I haven't seen it. Uh, Louis Noriega says, that sounds like the family that was killed about the algae bloom. Yeah, I still wonder about that. Uh, it was a, a, a family, a uh, mother, father, and a small child, uh, and their dog all mysteriously died in, the, in California, and they completely shut it down and later issued a statement that it was an algae bloom that killed them. Uh, algae blooms in water will only affect people if they drink it, and the, the article went on, we even said that they had bottles of water on them. So there's no way they were drinking out of some stagnant pond. Something's really fishy about that story and they covered it up. Mm. They cover up a lot. Oh yeah. A lot of stories. Robert Sharp says most of Kentucky was wiped out by the tornadoes, especially Mayfield and the towns around LBL. I've, I've heard that. I mean, we've, we, we mentioned it before. I'll say it again. Our hearts and prayers are out to the people that are affected by those storms. Yeah, you know, we uh we got hit here in Springfield, but nowhere near what happened through Kentucky and Tennessee. I mean, just yeah. just a massive amount of damage. A four state tornado. That tornado tracked over 240 miles across four states. Uh, that's just unheard of. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, that's why I wasn't on the show last weekend. Mm -hmm. Was the the minor little bit of storms we had? Yeah, you know, no power, no internet, and you know, like we said, rocking it like the Amish. But no damage, thank God. Yeah, Brian Merrick says there's still 109 people missing from the tornadoes in Kentucky last week. That is horrible. Well, yeah, I am going to probably have to sign off here. Uh, I'm starting to wind a little bit slow here, and I've got got a, a, a wife to take care of here. So we uh, will. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah, I understand. Um, so. We're going to start wrapping things up. I think uh, before we do, I'm going to give a, a, away an audio code. Uh, for Codename Wild Hunt, Odin's Call. Uh, so if you've been chat active in the chat in the last 15 minutes, um, I will do another another quick drawing before we start wrapping things up. So uh, Nightbot has been going, been going steady, keeping an eye on everybody, and it looks like the chat's been fairly steady. So how about we just go ahead and draw? So here we go, folks. And it looks like Brian Merrick won the code. There you go. Brian, if you will contact me at daroberts at daroberts.net. Um, this email right here. Uh, contact me at that, at that email address, and I will send you an audio code for a free download from ACX for Codename Wild Hunt, uh, Odin's Call, narrated by Cameron Buckner from Dix Dixie Cryptids. That's awesome. 
Congratulations, Brian. Congratulations, Brian. And Kim is so much fun to listen to anyway. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm much like Steve. I'm starting to wind down myself. It's been a long day. Yes. We, um, we braved the crowds at, at Sam's Club today to stock up for uh, for the next you know foreseeable future. And uh, it was a, a taxing day. I, uh, I'm pretty war. I'm pretty wore out myself. So, uh, you know, Mark, to, Mark Napier says, good night, Steve. And yeah, Brian Merrick says, what do you mean? I won. What did I win? Brian, you won an audio code for code name, wild hunt Odin's call. The first book of my, of my, uh, code name, wild hunt series narrated by Cameron Buckner. Uh, if you'll contact me at DA Roberts at DA Roberts.net, I'll put that address up again. If you contact me at this email, this email address, da roberts at da roberts .net, I will email you the code. Uh, so just go ahead and contact me as soon as you as soon as you have a chance, and um, well, I'll get that out to you as soon as, as soon as I get your email. Uh, Anna, I want to thank you for coming on tonight. You have been an awesome guest. Well, thank uh, you, Fred. If you're still listening, thank you, brother, for coming on. You you. You are an awesome storyteller, uh, fantastic guest. I would love to have you back on. Anna, same for you. I'd love to have you back on sometime. Uh, just had a fantastic time tonight listening to stories and really, really some intense storytelling tonight, folks. And these are firsthand encounters. These aren't something we heard from a, a friend that we heard from a friend or we read online. These are firsthand accounts. And they, some of them are just bone chilling. Uh, had, a, had a great time tonight. I've really enjoyed the, enjoyed this show. Enjoyed both our guests. Anna, you are awesome. Uh, like I said, Fred, if you're listening, you are awesome, brother. Thank you guys for so much for joining us. Steve, brother, appreciate you, man. Oh, Carrie, it's always a pleasure. Carrie, if you're listening, I hope your uh, your daughter gets to feeling better. And uh, you know, appreciate everybody for tuning in tonight. I've said it many times. We don't have fans. We have friends. And I enjoy hanging out and, uh, in the, and, and in participating in the chat and answering questions. And it's, it's, it's just a wonderful time spending time with everybody. And I hope every one of you have a blessed holiday season and filled with family, friends, and fellowship that I, I wish all of you the best this season. And again, our hearts and prayers go out to those affected by those terrible storms that struck the heartland here. And uh, it was just a tragic, tragic event, especially right before Christmas. And um, our hearts and prayers and, and thoughts are all with all those families. And I want to thank you guys, everybody, for joining us. Uh, I, you know, I've said this many times uh, about my books, that stories are journeys that we take together. And I have been truly blessed that you have taken this journey with me. Um, and if, you, uh, if you're if you interested in checking out some of my books, you can check them out at daroberts.net. All of my books are currently available on Amazon uh, in Kindle, print, and most of them now in hardback edition. <coughs> Uh, and we are working on getting all of them available in in uh, audio as well. Uh, and more of those are coming. So thank you guys for joining us. Again, check out, well, let me throw the uh, the picture up. I've got a graphic for that. Here's the, new, the uh, newest release, which is Codename Wild Hunt Operation Lily and Other Tales. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. Lakeview 3 is, all, is getting close to winding down. It is over 50,000 words. So I've got a lot of, a lot of projects that, that are coming right after that. And, uh, you know, if you uh, want to check these out, you uh, can find them, again, at all at daroberts.net. Uh, or on Amazon. Uh, check out all of the titles that are available because a lot of them are cryptid related. Um, again, thank you guys for joining us. It has been an amazing show. Anna, thank you again. You were you were fantastic. Really enjoyed having you on the show. Um, Fred, Fred, thank you for joining us. Gary, thank you for joining us. And I want to want to wish everybody a great night and a happy holidays. So hope you guys will, will tune tune in on Wednesday. Uh, when we're going to be talking about the the um, Kelly, Kentucky, the little uh, the incident that happened there back in the 1940s. So hope you guys will tune in and check that out. So we will see you on Wednesday. And again, I hope you guys have a blessed holiday. Thank you guys for joining us. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you for joining us tonight on DAX Machina. If you ever have an encounter of your own that you wish to discuss, Contact us at daroberts at daroberts.net. You can remain completely anonymous if you wish. 
Pull your covers up tight and keep a nightlight burning bright. Oh, and did you forget to lock your doors? Oh. <laughs>